So I have a quick intro about Charlie to give before we get started. So we are here with Charlie Hoyt, very grateful to have him here with us. Um, he holds a doctorate degree in bioinformatics, um, but even above and beyond that, he's a software developer and a self-proclaimed open scientist. He is a maintainer for the PyBell package, which is an ecosystem in Python for working on uh, working with the biological expression language. So we are super grateful to have him here today to talk about uh, Python documentation, continuous integration and packaging, i.e. how to be a good uh, data scientist um, and responsible coder. So uh, with that, Charlie, go ahead and take it away. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the introduction, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I guess we should also thank Corona Y for organizing all of us together. Yes, um, definitely. So right now this is set up, we're recording, so anybody can look at this after the fact. Um, I think everyone's stuck on mute the whole time, so the way that this is going to work is you can send some messages to the chat, and Dan will relay them to me if, uh, if they seem relevant. Maybe if they, they can wait to between sections or to the end, then, then we'll do that instead. Um, I blocked off three hours for this because uh, if, you, if you know me, you know I can talk forever without stopping. Um, there's, there's enough content to go over that we could talk about this together forever without stopping. And um, I'm trying to show you guys some of the most important stuff. So we'll do our best to get to everything. In the chat, I left a, a link to our Google Doc that's got the information about the overview of this and actually the checklist of all the things that I want to accomplish together. There's also a repository that has all of the code already done, ready to look at. And um, when I made that, I was laughing and I added it to the Google Doc after the fact that this is a lot like a baking show. You know, we're gonna do a lot of stuff together and you put it in the oven and you walk over to the next oven and you take it out and it's all ready to go. So we've already got the, uh, the pre-cooked version of this repository we're gonna create together that's got all the bells and all the whistles. However, um, you, you want to see how it evolves over time because one of the things you can do with a lot of code is copy paste it from other people. And this is really nice that we can do that, but uh, we wanna kind of learn how it got there. And, and so we're gonna go through the entire process. I even made a new GitHub account and uh, you're gonna see me signing up for all of the services in case some of those things are also a little bit um, scary for you. I, I know sometimes going to new websites and figuring out is this one useful or not, is this tricky? So we're gonna do all that. Um, I have to close my door so I don't bother my roommates or, or get any interesting uh, stuff from the, the street. So if anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat. I'll be moderating the chat and we'll uh, bring them to Charlie's attention as they come up. Okay, and then kind of without further ado, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I'm gonna try and do this in a way that's like the least distracting. There's always stuff that you're not expecting that's gonna pop up. So let's start by sharing my Safari screen. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at, at GitHub. And if you're starting a new open source project, this is a great place to start. And uh, we're gonna make a repository together. So yeah, I, I think maybe the best way is probably just to, to follow along. I, I doubt that you'll be able to actually do all the stuff at the same speed that I'm doing it. So maybe just sit back and relax and enjoy the show. So um, let's see, if you wanna follow along to this as I'm starting to make Oh, I'm not, uh, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, whatever. We're just gonna try it and see what happens. So I'm gonna make a new repository on GitHub. Oh, I have to verify my account, I guess. Oops, one sec. <laughs> Okay, good, my account is now verified. Has anybody else had that problem where you try making too many accounts and then you start mixing them up with each other? <laughs> so here we are on GitHub, we're gonna make a repository. And um, this, this talk isn't really about writing Python code, to be honest, it's not about algorithms, it's not about the syntax and the semantics of the language. Um, it's, it's about how to organize stuff. So I'm only gonna make one function to show you and it's gonna be a very simple function. Um, and, and I kind of want to show how you would take code that you've written and put it into a library. So immediately, I, I'm just going to start with this one. I'm going to call it uh, iter together 
because the function I want to write, oh, let's see, check, make sure. Can everybody see it? Okay, good. So, so the, the, the function that we're going to write is, its job is going to be really simple. It's going to read two files at the same time and it's going to iterate over both of them at the same time. I thought this might be useful because the other day I was dealing with the PubChem data set. If you're not familiar with PubChem, it's a list of, you know, probably 120 or more million molecules. And uh, you can download the data off of their, their FTP server, and it's quite big. You don't really want to read those files into memory, but um, you have one file that has two columns that go together, and then you have another file that has two columns that go together with the identifier for the compound, and then with the name in, in one of the files, and then the other file has the identifier for the compound and the smile strings. These are big files, so I want to iterate over both of them together because I know that the columns are the same. So I'm going to make a, a new repository that helps me do that. And um, maybe you're familiar with GitHub, so I don't really want to explain how to use GitHub, but we always want to start with the readme. And we're always going to want to start with a license and a git ignore. So I usually pick the MIT license. This one's really good for academic work you want people to be able to use. And I always take the Python git ignore. And I can create my repository, and it's all going to be there ready to go for me. Charlie, quick question. Are there situations where you wouldn't want to use the MIT license for any reason? Um, that's a good question. And the, the place where you can learn about that is called choosealicense.com. And, and yeah, this is one of the resources I wanted to share with everybody. Um, technically, you're not supposed to give legal advice on <laughs> choosing licenses, so I don't want to get in trouble. So I want to share this resource and allow you to, to learn for yourself. Um, you know, most of the licenses that people are using these days are the MIT license or the Apache license. The Apache license is a little bit better if you might consider uh, writing a patent to go with your code. Um, there's also these other ones called um, like GPL, which uh, and, and this whole family of, of licenses that have kind of these viral licenses. So anybody who makes derivations of your code also is, is bound to share that code back. And uh, this is a very anti-industry kind of license. It's a very free, open movement type license. Um, you know, it, it depends on, on what you're really going for when you, when you choose these things. MIT is the, the one that I've found works the best for people working in academia or with academics. So uh, yeah, you can, you can read a little bit more. Another thing to keep in mind, mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing to keep in mind is that these open source licenses are for code. Um, if you're creating uh, content, you actually have to give it a license, otherwise people are legally not allowed to use it. Um, so if your repository doesn't have a license, it means that nobody can actually use your code. It's kind of strange because they can see it, but yeah. Um, and don't quote me on exactly what are the legal specifics. When I say they can't use your code, it might be they can't distribute your code or they can't download it. Um, but you, you want to make sure that you communicate to people who might use your code how they're allowed to use it. And that's the job of the license. So if you're, if you're giving licenses to other things like data, there's other kinds of licenses. Um, the Creative Commons ones are particularly good for scientists and, and people working in that area. Um, so yeah, you've got your Git repository and um, you've got your license and your README and your Git ignore. Um, for everyone who's not familiar with Git ignore, as we're working with Git, there's this, this file says don't accidentally commit certain files. So with Python, there's these like .py c files, these .py o files, and these .py d files that get created. They're kind of like compiled intermediates for Python script. Even though Python's interpreted, it still has some build artifacts. You don't want to accidentally commit those. You don't want to commit these PyCache folders. Um, later, we're going to create distributions and builds of our code. You don't want to commit that either. These are created by the, the systems that are packaging it, but you don't actually want those to be in Git. Um, another one that is particularly egregious among the Python community is the IPy uh, NB checkpoints folder. If anyone's ever used Jupyter Notebook, you know it creates this folder with some extra stuff. You shouldn't commit that to Git either, so you usually want to put that into your Git ignore. Um, maybe that's here already. Yep, good. Um, if you're working on Mac, you'll know that every folder that you, you read with the finder gets a, fold, a file called .dsstore. This is also a pain in the butt, and you don't want to have to worry about committing that kind of file to, to your Git repository either, because it's just garbage. OK, so the next step after we do this is we're going to we're gonna open it in GitHub Desktop. Oh, boy. OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to share it with my other Git, Git account, and then we're going to open with GitHub Desktop. 
access. Okay. So now I'm going to stop sharing on Safari because we're not going to need Safari for a little bit. And then I'm going to start the share up again in the command line. Can everyone see? Hello. Yep. <laughs> okay, good. So we're going to go into my dev folder where I usually download everything and we're going to clone our repository. Oh, I need to do one thing first. I need to accept that share. Okay, good. So now I've cloned it. This is all you need to see on, on the terminal. The next thing I'm going to do is open it up within PyCharm. Oh, we weren't seeing the terminal if you were coding in the terminal. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what do you see? <laughs> uh, just the GitHub page, just your uh, like Safari browser. Oh, bummer. Um, well, I did something very boring. Let me see if I can switch it to terminal. Okay. Can you see the terminal now? Now I can see it, yeah. Okay, well, I did something very boring in the terminal. I just cloned it. I think you should all be familiar with cloning. If you're, if you're not, that's not the point of this talk and it's not really important, but this is a good way to deal with stuff on the internet. Um, okay, next step is we're going to PyCharm and we're going to open this project up. And now we get to the, you know, the meat of, of the talk, which is all going to be through PyCharm. All right. Okay, Dan, let me know. Can you see PyCharm? I'm seeing PyCharm, yes. Great. So we're off to the races. The, okay, I get to make three checks. This is really good. One, two, three. So um, the first thing uh, that we want to do with Python projects is we want to switch away from Markdown to restructured text. And when I say we want, I don't mean that we really want it because I kind of like Markdown better. But restructured text is sort of the de facto standard for, for Python. So we're going to rename this re readme file to readme.rst. And uh, there's only a little bit of a difference between restructured text and, and Markdown. So we just have to make our titles kind of look like this. All right. That was the first step. Check. The, the next thing we're going to want to do is actually create the outline of a project. Um, and this is, this is where, if you already have a bunch of Python code, what I would suggest doing is starting a totally new folder structure somewhere else and putting it there. Because the first thing you want to do is create a folder called source. This is really common in not just Python, but all sorts of other languages, having this, this folder called SRC, which is an abbreviation for source. And yeah, this is a really long standing thing that the people with Unix have been abbreviating things with very short names for a long time. So anyway, we make this source folder and all of our Python code is gonna go inside this source folder. And since we're making a package, we want our Python folder to be called the same thing as the package, iter together. And this is a really important thing that I, that I should point out while we're here. I named the project on git iter dash together. And the folder in here inside our source folder is called iter underscore together. It's a little bit confusing. Um, the reason it's like this is because the standard for URLs and for names of Git repositories have dashes in it, but Python, you can't have a dash inside a name, so you have to use the underscore. And, and if you're familiar with Python a little bit, you know that um, we use this kind of snake case instead of the camel case or some of these other funny names for cases, like, like in Java, you have this camel case, but Python, you have underscores between the words. Okay. Uh, I hope that all of you are using PyCharm. If you've got an academic um, affiliation or an, an academic email, you can get the PyCharm Pro for free through GitHub's pack. Um, I would totally suggest doing this because it's really good. One of the things that we can do once we're in PyCharm is we can mark that this is actually a directory that we have source code in it. This makes a lot of other things work really well in PyCharm. It's not strictly necessary. So if you're not in PyCharm, this doesn't make a difference and it's not gonna affect your ability to, to follow along with this stuff. 
So anyway, um, you, you saw that I, I created the folder source and then, you know, PyCharm has this, this new and then create Python package menu. And when you make a Python package, you get this file called underscore init. And actually there's two underscores and the people in the Python community call two underscores a dunder, a double underscore. So, so now you've probably learned a new word and welcome to Python packaging. So uh, it's time to start writing some Python code. I'm gonna write a very tiny amount of it. Um, the first thing is you should go into this init um, file and you should make a module level doc string. If you've never written doc strings before, you're also gonna learn a lot today. Um, the first executable line of every Python code, if you use triple double quotes, it actually gets interpreted on the top level as a documentation string for that module. So in the init py file, at the top level of, of our package, iter together, it's the place where you, you just give a very high level description. So uh, we're going to say a package that helps you iterate through parallel. Okay, and since it's my tutorial, I can make you guys do whatever I want. We're going to instill this other standard that all Python files should have this coding statement at the top. So this tells, this tells the interpreter really, really clearly that this file is in UTF-8 and not some other crazy formatting. And then, you know, we put a blank line and then we put another blank line after the doc string and then we can start writing stuff. Um, right now, we're not going to put anything in our init.py file. We're going to make another Python file. This one's going to be called utils.py. And I'm going to copy paste all this stuff. So um, the API for together. So inside this file, utils.py, I'm actually going to write the function whose job it is to iterate over two Python uh, or over two text files together that are like CSVs and uh, put the output. So Good question. Uh, so so because you structure that header like that, the interpreter knows that it's referring to the coding scheme. Yes. Okay. This is a really, this is a really tricky thing. There's another thing you can also put in the in the first line, which is called a shebang which is like one of these, but we're not gonna do that because we don't want people to be, I'll come back to why I don't wanna do that later. Okay. But this is a really good thing to put on all of your files. And it just tells everybody you know what you're talking about. You want everybody to think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Most importantly, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. So now we're gonna write the only like, okay, a very small amount of the Python code that we plan on writing. So I'm gonna write a function. I hope everyone's aware that you do def. And then, um, you know, this, this is, a very single purpose package. So I'm actually going to call the function the same thing as the package iter together. So um, this is how I always start by writing my functions. It's got to have a name that's good and now it's got to have a, a, a description that's really good. Maybe I need to say what's going to go in. So this is going to be path left. Right. So open the two files. Iterate over them and zip them together. So, yeah, we'll, we'll go right into documentation now. You saw that uh, a module level doc string comes up here. And when you write a function, you always write a doc string as the first line of the function, also using triple double quotes. Your function should, uh, sorry, your, your doc string should have a couple properties. Like it should be written in the imperative mood. So, if you don't remember what the imperative mood is or English isn't your first language, uh, just remember that you should be able to yell this at the computer and it should sound right. Open the two files, iterate over them and zip them together. Um, it should also just be one line. It should fit uh, there. You can also make this doc string longer and put some extra information. Um, one of the things that's really important is to use this thing called param, path left and param path right. And this is the place where you get the chance to write doc strings. I'm sure you've benefited from like pandas, which has really, really good documentation. And if you didn't know, all the doc strings are actually written inside the functions themselves. And that information gets propagated from those functions into the documentation that you read. This is the same thing for PyTorch. It's the same thing for NumPy. It's the same thing for the Python documentation itself of the, of the core library. So um, yeah, this is a place where we can say what, what these things are. So this is a path to a CSV file. 
a path to a CSV file. I mean, if it's obvious, you don't have to do a lot of documentation, but if it's not obvious, this is your chance to write something that actually helps the reader. So um, yeah, I'm gonna also add type annotations. If you don't know what type annotations are, this is kind of like a Java world. It, it's a little bit of extra information to tell people what's going on inside your function. So I'd rather people are passing file strings, uh, sorry, the path, like a string describing the path to a file to this function. This function is gonna take care of opening up the file and it's gonna take care of um, yeah, actually doing the stuff that we want it to do. I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I don't actually wanna implement this function because we're good people and we're gonna write tests before we write any code. But before we can write any tests, we have to get, make sure that this code can be installed. So we're gonna take a step back and we're going to make sure that the code is set up in a way such that we can install it with pip. I'm sure everybody's tried installing something with pip before, so you get most of your code in, uh, into your computer. And we're now gonna make sure that our code that we just wrote can get in via pip as well. So, I wanna do one more thing before we get to that. I wanna make another file. Just a quick comment, people are very excited and happy that you're able to do typing in Python, and that's a new discovery for some people. Um, that's cool. Welcome. Um, you don't have to do this and you don't ha if you do it sometimes you don't have to do it always. You should do typing when it's helpful and extra useful. Um, there's never going to be a time where you are forced to use typing and you can also do whatever the heck you want here. Uh, you can write this as my string and it's allowed. You could, yeah. So, so this is, this is part of the language, but mm, it's not really enforced to do anything in particular. Um, I'm not gonna say much more about typing today. This is on the, the end of the list. If we're so done with everything before three hours, we can talk about type checking, but I'd rather not get into that now. So anyway. There's a quick follow-up question. What's the format for adding type hints to the doc string? For adding types uh, to the doc string? Yeah. Um, well, well, technically the old way of doing it before the you know, cool way happened is you would put it between where it says param and path left and you can write stir right here, okay? The better way is to use the type annotation. And for me, I actually like using type annotations because they're a better way of generating documentation than writing this. Now, we're in PyCharm and there's a secret you can do to bring up the doc string for something pre-generated. So, because we wrote the doc string in the correct format, it already pops up here and PyCharm knows how to turn it into something that we can introspect. Sweet. Yeah, and, and uh, this is a little bit different on everyone's system because I don't know what PyCharm's default settings are, but to bring up that window, I pressed function and then F1. Okay. So we're gonna come back to this and we're gonna implement this function together. And maybe you've even got an idea on how you might wanna do it. Um, and maybe we make it a game and then everybody can provide their own implementation and then we'll compare. Uh, but before we do that, I want to make sure that we can install this package. And one of the important things before you um, make packages installable is that you should version your information. So I made another Python file called version.py. And I'm going to make the module doc string versioning information. Every time I start a, a Python project, I always make this version file and I give it version 0.0.1-dev. Um, maybe you've seen this kind of thing before where you have this like number, point, number, point, number. Python has this versioning scheme. It's right now Python version 3.8.1 is I think the stable build. There's also Python 3.9.0-alpha1. So what we're looking at right now is something called semantic versioning. And I'm not going to, um, to go into that a ton, but this is sort of a, a standard and I wanna sh just share a link to the website that explains that with everybody. But I can't find the, the chat. <laughs> chat, here we go. So in the chat, I just copy pasted a link to a website called uh, semver.org. And this is kind of a manifesto describing how you should be taking care of your version strings. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do this, right? You could also have incremental. You could be like, this is version one. When I make some changes, it becomes version two. Or maybe it's version 1.0, and then later it's version 1.1. Or maybe it goes from 1.0 to 2.0, and you just like the sound of 0.0. Um, I don't know. It doesn't really make a difference. But semantic versioning is the one that everyone else uses. And because 
it takes a lot of extra effort to understand what people are doing when they're using their own style. We try and stay away from that kind of stuff. And let's just use semantic versioning because everyone else is using it. It makes it easier to understand other people's code. And that's the goal of a lot of these things. That's why I make choices for this or that when there are two different things you can use. Okay. So that was a pretty easy Python file, right? I just wanted to put version in there. So it's time to do uh, the setup.config. This is gonna be something that you probably have never seen before. So I'm gonna make a new file. Um, inside it or together, we're gonna create a new file called setup.cfg. Maybe you've seen files that end with cfg before and you never knew it was called a config file. So maybe you just learned something new as well. Now. Let's see the best way to start. Give me one second. Um, inside this file, we're going to put all of the information that pip needs in order to take the code and install it so we can import it from anywhere in Python. Uh, you know, the same way that we import everything else. We just uh, give it the right metadata and it knows to link all that stuff together. So the first thing is we're going to start writing this config file and if you've never seen a config file before, usually they start with these headers, which are in square brackets, and then they have some keys and some values. So the whole file will look like this, you know, other two, other key, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we just have to put the right metadata and then everything, um, everything happens. Oh, I just saw cookie cutters coming. Yeah, we're, we're not going to get to that, but this would solve all of your problems without you doing anything. Um, so when, when you want to start, you, first of all, you have to do the name of the package and we're going to call it iter together, iter, iter together. Um, so, so notice the name for iter together here is exactly the same as the name of the package that we've given it. These have to be exactly the same. If they're not the same, this isn't going to work. I can't tell you why this doesn't work if they're not the same. Um, bad things happen if you, if you make this choice the wrong way. So then we have to give it the version. And uh, for now, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing that we did in the version uh, Python file. But later, we're going to come back to making this a little more automated so we don't have to keep track of it in every different place. And um, then we have to add a couple of kind of goofy things, which, yeah. All right, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to type them out, and you're going to have to accept them as gospel because I don't understand them either. So we have another um, header called options. And inside this one, we've got um, packages. And then we do this kind of funny thing, which is find. And what this says is, hey, Pip, we're, we're following the rules. Everything's structured exactly the way it should be. So just do what you're supposed to do. And then we have to do this other one, package dir equals source. So it says, yeah, everything's structured the way it's supposed to be, but it's inside the source folder. Quick and question. We, yeah. um, is the config file specific to pip or is it compatible with conda environments as well? Oh, you know, that's a good question. And uh, I don't know the answer to it because I spend as much time not using conda as possible. And, <laughs> and it's really interesting uh, because conda is, is a way around doing all of this stuff kind of solves a lot of these problems for you without really addressing the issue. Um, so these ecosystems kind of coexist and you can, you can use all of this stuff in Conda. You can do Conda install. And if you have a setup.config file, Conda knows what to do because it's also using pip, you know, deep down inside. Gotcha. And gotcha. The, the question, uh, the difference between setup.config and setup.py, the answer is coming very soon. We're about to get back to that. And then why do we use version inside, um, uh, config and version.py. That's a little bit of a, a goofy thing about, um, about how this is all set up. I, I'm going to come back to that later. Actually, kind of at the end of the talk, we're going to talk about single stream versioning, single source versioning, and bump version to, to address that. OK. And, and I hate to do this because this is the part that I, again, don't understand. We need one more piece of configuration. All right. So with all of this information, it should be enough that we can pip install our package. We know what the name is. You have to have a version, not optional. Um, and then between these you know, six lines, then pip knows all the information it needs to find the information. Now pip is aware of the, the structure of the directory. 
because all these are relative to the setup.cfg file. Okay, so Python console, don't want that, I want terminal. All right, so we're going to, yep, we've got this new virtual environment. You don't have to know anything about virtual environments to do this, you can, you can start your own code wherever you want. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot something. <laughs> um, if we try pip installing this, it's not going to be able to, uh, to do it because there's no setup.py file. So uh, thanks for, for Anak for pointing this one out because we do need a setup.py file. And the great thing is that setup.py looks exactly the same in every single project. So there's only, technically there's only two lines you need for setup.py, setup tools, setup tools, dot setup. Okay, we're kind of done. Um, so here's what happens with setup tools and with pip and with all this stuff. And maybe you've even heard of easy install. There's like three or four different levels of Python packaging and all of these packages that do the Python packaging are built on top of each other. And um, at the bottom is something called dist utils. And on top of that is setup utils. And then on top of that is easy install. And then they threw that one away. And then pip also wraps up setup tools. So what, what this, Entry point does setup tool setup is it says whatever directory I'm in, find the setup.cfg file, take all the metadata out of that, and then figure out how to set up everything based on that. So the cool thing is the code that actually sets up uh, and installs the Python package is, is Python code itself. And that's this, this you know, two line thing. And you know, I like to do it this way. I always do my main. Everybody seen this before? If name equals main. This is really important for packaging. Um, so, so if you haven't seen this before, we're going to come back to what this actually does in a little bit. It's not technically necessary in this situation, but we're going to need it later. So now that we've got our setup.py, we've got our setup.cfg, we've got our code that is actually in the appropriate directory structure, we should be able to pip install. So now we're going to look back down at the terminal. I hope this is big enough that everyone can see because I switched my laptop settings to, to have the most uh, ridiculous size to make this possible. And it's crazy working on this. So I, I hope that you enjoy it. Um, everybody's pip installed something before, probably. So you pip installed NumPy, but you probably never pip installed from uh, your, your own system. So one of the things you can do is you can pip install dot. And that says, I'm in a directory that has all of this stuff that you need to make a Python package. Um, it's got a setup.py. Basically, that's the rules. You need a setup.py. And, uh, and when you do pip install dot, it, you know, it, it knows there's a setup.py and it, it runs that file. There's one other thing that we can do. We can do dash e. And this dash e flag, ooh, crazy. This dash e flag says we're going to do it in um, editable mode. And what that means is that when you uh, pip install something, usually it downloads the files that are part of that Python package and it puts them in a specific directory called site packages, which is hidden away. And as an end user, you don't have to know anything about it. However, um, the code is copied there and that's it. So if we decide to install the code from my directory, which is my home directory slash dev slash iter together, if I pip install it, it's going to put a copy of all this code ready to go as a package into the site packages inside my you know, Python site packages, which because I'm in a virtual environment, um, it's an extra copy of it somewhere else. Um, but the problem is if I make changes, it doesn't get reflected in my Python installation. Well, here comes editable mode. Dash E means that it uses symlinks, which should work the same on both uh, Unix type systems and um, Windows. What it does is it symlinks it. So when you make changes in your repository here, it's gonna make changes in your Python installation. And because we're in development right now, we're making changes, this is exactly what we want. But you know, when you install stuff like NumPy, you don't need an editable version of this. You just kind of want it ready to go. So that's why we're doing dash E. I hope that makes sense. Um, inside the, the Python, sorry, inside the GitHub repository that's already done, there's actually an explanation written out of this in case you missed that one. Yes. All right, so we're gonna try it, see if it works. All right, it didn't work. I need to do a parse option of dict. All right. Now it's time for debugging because you can never be right in a live coding. Uh, so we have to figure out what we've, what we've forgotten. Oh, okay, I know what I did wrong. No, I don't.
Okay, I figured out what it did wrong. There's a typo. We need an equal sign there. <laughs> so um, I, I said that the, this is a config file and there's this very simple key value format. But you know, when you have an equal sign, you can also have a list. And this list is parsed in a special way that it's like a list of, of keys and values. So we have kind of an empty key here and then the value is source. Again, this is magical configuration. You don't have to understand these now seven lines. You just have to copy paste this one every time. If you want to know more, good luck. I, I can't figure it out. You're not going to be able to either unless you've got a lot of time. But I challenge you. Go ahead. Great. As you can see, we've successfully installed iter together. So um, you probably want to know what does this mean after all of this time? It's taken 40 minutes and you know six tweets uh, to get you here and to see that we could install things as a package. What do we really get from this? Let me show you. Now when we open up Python, yeah, we know about importing stuff, right? Import get pass, print get pass dot get user. You import stuff, you get the functions that are inside it. Now we're going to be able to import iter together. All right, so what's inside it or together? Maybe you never thought about this, but when you, when you import something like get pass or you import OS, sorry, I said it out loud, but I didn't type it. When you import OS, you get os.path. And maybe you've used os.path.join before. I'm using this one all the time. But how does it know what path is? And how does it know what join is? So, so there's this hierarchy, right? OS is the name of the package, and then there's kind of something in the middle, and then there's this join function. Um, and, and sometimes we, we have classes that we import, so mm -hmm. then you get a class sitting inside a Python file somewhere. Now I want to show you exactly how all that stuff gets attached together. So we've got iter, to, uh, iter together. One thing that you can do to sort of figure out a package you don't understand is you can use the dir function. And the dir function kind of works like it works in the command line. It, it lists all the stuff that's inside an object. But maybe before we do that, we could, we could ask, what's the type of iter together? Like, what is this? It's a module. OK, good. And because it's a module, it's got you know, a list of stuff inside it. Maybe, maybe that thing about the type wasn't necessary, not helpful. But um, let's see what's inside. So we've got built-ins, cache, doc, file, loader, name, package, path, spec. Actually, all that stuff is really scary sounding, and I don't really want to go into any of it. Um, unfortunately, we, we haven't made any of our code available directly from it or together. And now I want to go back to uh, that file that we talked about back in the beginning, which I kind of glossed over, init.py. Init.py is the secret magic that holds all of the packaging together, because this is the place that allows you to organize your code in a way for other people to use. And that's kind of the theme of everything we're doing right now is how do we make our code useful for other people? And we also consider future selves as other people. Do you think past Charlie had any idea what future Charlie was going to do? No. And uh, I don't have an idea what future Charlie's going to do either. So I want to make sure that all the code is written in a way such that he can use it. So when we're in our init.py file, anything that's here is going to get populated into this it or together module. So there's kind of this correspondence between the init file and then the directory that it's in. So that code kind of goes and gets called whatever the directory is. So here's how we can demonstrate that. Let's, uh, let's call this foo equals bar. You've seen foo and bar over and over again. Um, we're going to have to quit the Python interpreter and start it back up. Even though we're in editable mode, um, it's going to you know, maintain its, its state unless we start it over. There's a way around that and it's very scary. Let's not talk about it. So let's try importing iter together again. Now let's do dir iter together. Now, what I claimed was that when you put stuff in the init file, it's gonna pop up inside the top level thing. So we should see in this list, foo. And we do, all right. So now we know about getting stuff into the package we've kind of organized all the code and we can import it. The last thing we want to do is make sure that the code that we wrote inside the iter together package can be imported and used. And so there's two ways of doing this. One is the janky way where we already could do it, but we just haven't thought of it yet. What we could actually do is we could import iter together.utils. 
and that works. And then if we do dir of iter together dot utils, then we're going to see the function iter together is already available. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen something like this before, but you also can do from iter together dot utils import iter together. Okay, and now if I look at the type of iter together, turns out that because the module is named the same thing as the function, I've just clobbered the module, and now the thing that's inside our Python locals is the function. So we should see class as the function. And, um, and we could also print out the documentation string that we spent all that time writing. And so, yeah, we could use this function. Basically, we, we've kind of got everything we want, except that's kind of annoying. It doesn't really matter that there's a utils function in here. That's just for our organization. We really want to be able to import iter together dot iter together. And the way that we do that is we start messing around with our init.py file. And we're going to use what's called uh, relative imports. So when you've written Python files before, you've used imports. This is nothing new. We've, we've talked about doing this. You can import OS. You can import get pass. But now that we're inside package world, we can do something very, very special. We can import the stuff that's sitting next to us. So we can do from dot utils import iter together. The dot means we're in the same level because the init.py file is sitting in the same folder as utils.py. And the dot utils is the name of the module. So there's no dot pi after this, even though it's called utils.py, we just have to say dot utils. And we know the iter together is a function inside that um, module. So if we do this, and then we start our Python over, import iter together. And then we do dir. We've got our function. Iter together is now available. And also utils is as well. There's a couple ways that we can get around this, but it's, it's very nitty gritty and I'd like to move on to the next thing. So I get to put another check on our checklist because we've now begun with setup.cfg and setup.py. We've gotten to the point where we've organized our code. We've got all the configuration we need to get it set up in Python with us. And we now know how to make the code work in a way such that we can organize it to look nice and to be easy for people to get what they actually need out of it. So uh, the only problem is if I, if I run the iter together function, oh, I'm going to come back to that in one second. If I run the iter together and uh, I give it two file paths, uh, well, it doesn't even matter what I give it because there's a problem. We didn't implement it yet. OK. Um, there was a question from, from, yeah, OK, does this also clobber iter together? Um, so right now, when we import iter together, this is the module, and iter together dot iter together. So this is the module, iter together is the first one, and then the function, which is kind of a member of the module, is the second one. So there's no clobbering. In fact, this is one of the things that, uh, that Tim Peters suggested way back in the day. I don't know if you've ever seen import this, but there's something called the Zen of Python. And uh, if you ever forget, you can just import this. The last thing in import this is actually describing the solution to this problem about clobbering. Namespaces are one honking great idea. Let's do more of those. And what this means is that I just imported the top level um, you know, Python package, and then I use this dot notation to get the stuff out of it that I wanted. And it means that it's a lot more specific, and then it's a lot easier to understand than if I just start using um, iter together as a function, then maybe you're not sure if that's the module or if that's the function. You know, one of the other solutions is not to use the same name for the function as the module. But maybe you've used TQDM before, and TQDM, the module, and TQDM, the function, also have the same name. And this gets a little confusing sometimes, too. But it's worth it, because it's really nice. It looks good. It's, it's fast. It's clean. So yeah, you have to use your best judgment on this one. All right. So the code's ready. Um, it doesn't do anything. So what's the next step? Tests, unit testing. Do you write unit tests for all your code? 
Everyone who writes unit tests for their code, please send a message right now. I write unit tests for my code. I'll give you a second to think about if you want to lie or not. Okay. Well, maybe you don't know how to write unit tests yet. And, and this is a good place to learn because we're gonna, we're gonna write a very simple function that does something very simple. And then you're gonna know how to do it from now on. Okay, some people said sometimes, some people said I try, I should, begrudgingly, grudgingly, yes. Yep, exactly, I don't know how to use PyTest. Good, great. Then, then we're gonna start using PyTest. And actually I started talking about PyTest and, and that's already a little bit esoteric. Um, Python has a unit testing framework built into it, and we're going to use that unit testing framework to write our tests. We're going to use PyTest to run the tests, but you know, these are things that I don't have huge opinions about. However, there are a lot of people who do have opinions about these things. When you have specific use cases, it may be better to use one or the other. For us, for now, you're just about to learn, so this is okay. So, um, much like the way that we structured our our code, the way we structure our tests is very, very important. Um, we don't put the tests with the code. We actually want to separate them. And we actually don't want to start writing tests until we can import our code programmatically like a package, which is why I didn't start by writing unit tests. Uh, otherwise, I would have. So what we do is we make another folder next to our source folder. We call this tests. Really important that you call it tests with an S. It has to be that. If it's not that, all of the unit testing frameworks don't pick it up. And this, again, is this thing about community standards. Do the same thing as everyone else so people don't have to look around for what are you up to. Now, this is an opinionated tutorial, and I'm doing all the things that I think are best. There are people who put tests inside the code with the other stuff. I disagree with this. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, I'll send you a link to my blog post where I, I linked to all of the nice blog posts that I read that led me to that opinion. So for now, we're going to start writing our tests inside the test folder. And the first thing we need is init. Turns out that we can almost treat tests like their own Python package. And because it's a Python package, we, we need to make sure that it's documented well. So unit tests for iter together. Um, and we need to create it very nicely because tests are important. Tests are first class code. You should care about your tests. You should refactor your tests. You should maintain your tests. I know it's a lot of work, but it turns out that if you are keeping code over time, then tests are really important. And I learned this the hard way because I've been maintaining the PyBell package for almost four years now. And I've done a couple major refactorings of the, the core of the package. However, the tests have made sure that I knew that everything kept working the way it's supposed to. This is something to keep in mind. I mean, you're really gonna thank yourself when you write tests. And the other thing about writing tests is it forces you to think about the problem before you actually solve it. So that's what we're gonna do right now. And, and uh, I'm gonna more directly outline the problem I wanted to solve with this iter together thing in the form of tests. So to do this, I'm going to borrow some of the stuff that I've written already because there's no sense in me uh, writing out some of the testing data. So let me just bring that up. work. Didn't work. Okay, good. I just added my two testing files. Um, the first one is this one. It's called F1. And it's, like I said, it's just it's a CSV file. It's got two columns. It's got some things, which we're going to think of as our keys. And it's got some values that go with our keys. We don't really have to think about exactly what these are when we're implementing our function, because this is kind of a general thing. And then we've got our second file, which I want to open them up split screen so you can see that. Um, zoom, get out of here. Yeah. OK, so you can see this file, this first file has, uh, oh, the first file has you know, our keys, and then it's got some values that go with it. And our second file has the same keys, but it's got different kinds of values. And the original scenario that I had is I, I have these super big files. You know, they're like 10 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes, maybe 100 gigabytes. 
And I wanna be able to write a program that reads two files at the same time and keeps track of the stuff that goes with each other. The good news is both of these files are always gonna have the same keys in the same order. So I wanna iterate one line at a time through both of them at the same time. Does this make sense? I hope so. Once I write the unit tests, it might be a little bit more obvious. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a file that actually is for the tests. Test, uh, I guess I'm gonna call it test utils because the, the Python file that it goes with is called utils.py. Um, and then I'm gonna start writing some Python code that actually does the testing. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to import unit test. And what we do is we organize all of our unit tests into classes. So this is gonna be test, iter, together. And each of these classes inherits from the unit test test case. Test for iter together. Inside our class, we're, we're gonna be able to write functions. And these functions are actually gonna be the things that run as tests. So I'm gonna call it test, uh, test iter together. Okay, we're not, we're not coming up with really clever names for this because we only have one function and we only have one thing we need to test. So uh, test that two files can iterate together. All right. Now the next thing is we're going to import our code. Import iter together. And because we spent all that time packaging our Python code, we can import it like this, the same way that somebody else would use it at the end. Um, to, to make this work really well in PyCharm, by the way, you have to do this thing where you, where you mark the directory as, as source. Otherwise, it has a little bit of a problem um, indexing this, and it might give you the, the little underline that says there's a problem. But in general, this, this is just a, a IDE thing. Okay, so I want to I wanna write the tests that are going to check that this function does what it's supposed to. And if it's not clear what it's supposed to do already, then maybe this will make it clear. So let me just double check. Rather than trying to live code this and, and make a mistake, waste your time, we're going to just grab it from what I did before. All right. So, so what I want to say is, is that when I iterate over these two files, I want the, the result to be a, a triple, like a, a tuple with three entries in it that goes for every line. And I want to have my index be the first thing. And I want to have the column for the left. Yep. Yeah, it'll be great out if it's not used. We're getting there. Um, yeah, so, so, so we have the first row, and then we have the, the second column from the left file, F1. And then we have the second column from the second file, F2. So like, yeah, this makes sense. I showed you these files. The first file has ones in it, and the second file has twos in it, so you can remember what's there. And when I iterate over these two files together, I want to get this list of things in this order. So now we just have to kind of run the function on the files. So we're going to do iter together, dot iter together. Okay, I need a path to my left file and I need a path to my right file. So we're gonna do a little bit of a detour before we actually finish the tests. We're gonna make one more file called constants.py. This is inside our tests. Remember I told you tests are almost like a Python package on their own. So you might need some constants. So usually what I end up doing is I make a, an import to OS and then this is a really nice trick. I make a variable called here, which is gonna be OS dot path dot dir name. And then you give it this secret variable called file. It turns out that the, the file, the dunder file variable is always available in every Python file. And this is a variable that says what the location of the Python file is that you're in. So this is really good because it means that we can get the F1 path. And it's the same thing as os.path.join here because here is the tests folder now. And then we've got a file called f1.csv. Same idea for file f2, we just have to change the names. Great. And what did we forget? Um, this is a Python package, so we need to you know, document it, right? And we'll do that later. In general, don't do that. I want to show you what happens when you make mistakes like this, so we're going to skip it for the moment. All right, so we've got our constants file. Very simple. Um, now, we're going to do something kind of wild looking. We're going to do import uh, our from tests 
dot constants import f1 path f2 path so this is this is taking advantage of of another thing in python which is called absolute imports so we've kind of written up this tests directory as its own python package and to refer to all the stuff inside the tests package you can also say tests dot and then the name of the Python file inside it. All right, now we're gonna give it F1 path and F2 path, and this is the result. Okay, all we have to do now is use some of the functions for making comparisons that are already available. So this is really cool. You do self dot and then assert, and you get all of these functions who will help do checking of things being equal or things being greater or less than each other, things being inside each other. Um, you, can, you can read through the list. There's lots of documentation that's really good for the unit test module. And if you've been a Java programmer at some point and ascended to Python status, you'll, you'll be familiar with this because this is very similar to how JUnit tests look, which is actually how Python's unit test got its names as well. It, it's very, very much uh, coming from the JUnit testing land, which is cool because they actually were able to reuse some useful stuff from Java. So all we have to do is check these things are equal. We wanna make sure that the expected thing is equal to the actual thing. And now we, we have to run our tests because we wanna make sure that everything's working properly. Uh, so what do we do? First thing is we rely on PyCharm and this is the wrong way to do it. So PyCharm has a nice little button that pops up and says, hey, look, you're writing unit tests. Do you wanna run it? So for now, I'm gonna say yes, run my unit test. Okay, and here we go, PyCharm runs the unit test. And what happens? It says none is not equal to the thing that I wanted it to be equal to. There's no surprises here. We haven't implemented the function yet. So this iter together function returns nothing. So it can't possibly be equal to the thing we expected. So now that we've written our unit test, it's time to actually go and implement the function itself. There's one other thing though that I wanna do before we get there. I want to cast the result of this into a list because the iter function is gonna iterate one line at a time and I don't wanna write it in a way such that it has to read everything into memory because I was talking about using this for really big files. However, for our unit tests, we do need to make sure that the data types are the same for them to be equal. So we're gonna cast our iterable into a list. Um, yeah, so, so then uh, I'll show you exactly what that means once we, iter in, uh, once we implement it. Okay, there are a couple questions. There's a couple things for unit testing for machine learning. Alex asked, do you have examples for assert less? I always might find myself doing assert equal. Yeah, so one thing you might do is you might say like, um, rather than just checking assert equal, we might start by doing self.assert is not none result. Uh, because you know maybe we want to make sure it's not returning none at all, and then maybe we do a self to assert less equal zero should be less than or or how about just less zero should be less than the length of the result, right? So maybe that's a place where I'd use assert less. Um, there's other, I mean, this is maybe assert equal is the best one because we know exactly what it's supposed to be. But if we're just testing the properties of this, maybe saying that it's non-zero length is good too. All right, so we're ready to make an implementation. Um, I hope everybody understands what this function is supposed to do at this point. You saw that there's some files with, these, with this content in it. It's, it's obvious these are comma separated values files. So when we iterate through them, we wanna split every, every line based on a comma. Um, and then we know that the leftmost column in each of them is gonna be the same thing. So all we have to do is line up this other stuff together. So I think this might be a good time to, to take a little break and see if everybody wants to try implementing this. Is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? Like, is this, is this gonna be a bad use of everyone's time because uh, you haven't been able to keep up until now? Or push to GitHub, please? Okay, if I push to GitHub, then you can just use it directly. Here's the question. I'm gonna push to GitHub, Git. Ask. That's a good idea. I can. All right. 
shoot, this is bad. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe it's not going to be a good use of everyone's time for this, for, for keeping up. So I will show you the way that I'd implement this. Um, and maybe you'll even learn something because the way I code is, is quite a, a wild <laughs> ride itself. So let's go back to the source and to utils. Quickly before you so, go to that, can we look at the, the tests really quick? The tests? Yeah. Yeah. So the I might have missed this at the beginning, but the philosophy is that there's one test function that corresponds to one uh, source code function. And then within that function, there are all of the assert statements. Is that the right structure um, we should be thinking about? Almost. There, you can have uh, several several groups. So each each one of these def fun each one of these functions is going to test like one thing, one aspect uh, of a of a function or a class or something. Um, there might be other functionality of iter together. Like maybe we want to write another test for like def test uh, failure on, on bad keys, right? Maybe we, we write a function whose job it is to test what happens when the the columns aren't lined up properly. And we want to make sure that if we have bad input, that we get a, a value error raised or something like that. So, so the way you should think about it is that the class kind of groups together tests for similar stuff. And then each test is, is one sort of package of ideas. It may have several certs within a given test. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to say, you know, because, because writing tests is also as creative as writing code itself. Um, for, and, and then there's a question for larger repos. Do you still recommend using this format and storing all the tests in one flat tests folder? No. As you get to bigger projects, you may actually want to have nested tests folders. And, and if you check out PyBell, then, then you'll be able to see that there are quite a few uh, layers of tests. And, and you, know, you don't want to go too many layers deep because then you're becoming a Java programmer again. And, and we all don't want that, right? Um, so, so yeah, classes group together tests that may be similar, and I don't want to go into everything about it, but there's also this thing called setup. So if all the tests share something, you can use setup. It's kind of like an init file, and you can do self dot, you know, constant one equals five or something, and then that constant's always available everywhere in all of the tests in that class. So, so I just want to show you how to organize your testing stuff. I, I would suggest you, you do a lot of rating in unit tests. You do a lot of rating in pi test, which has a little bit different paradigm for organizing code. Um, yeah, it's just to get you there and to get the ideas and to make sure all the structure for everything is right. And then you can be creative and you can start, you know, making as many assumptions or not as you want. So, so we're only going to test that the function works correctly when the data is right. We're actually not going to implement this test failure. Um, in fact, the implementation I'm going to give isn't correct all the time. If you make mistakes, you're going to get results that you didn't want. Um, so, let's uh, yeah, let's let's do it, and then and then maybe by the end we'll come back to some of the tools that help you realize when you've not got enough tests. Um, this is also really important, and it's it's hard to know when you don't have enough tests, but there are some tools that can help with that. So, uh, do all the import statements stay the same once the test folder becomes deeper? All right, let's, let's do a little bit of an example. Let's call this like test deeper. No, 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 not test deeper, test Leonardo Caprio. Okay, so inside we're gonna keep making more like sub packages, which also have init functions. And I'm not gonna do all the due diligence with all the documentation, but let's call this like test my other stuff. So if we write unit tests in here, um, then you can you can do from tests.constants import f1. So, so that, that test.constants thing is still going to work the same way. And import iter together is still going to work the same way. So, so you really this this uh, folder is only for shared structure. It's not going to be for all these other things. You might be able to get away with stuff like if you have another constants file just inside test Leonardo DiCaprio, you might be, you might do like from uh, tests dot test Leonardo DiCaprio dot whatever and then import from there. Okay, so let's do it. Let's implement this function. If if there aren't any other questions, because these are good questions, I'm glad you're you're doing a little bit of interrupting, and I'm glad I found a place to leave the group chat so I can make Dan's job a little easier too. So is everyone happy with that? Does this make sense? I mean, I mean the philosophy of unit testing is is a little bit, you know, like I said, it's it's creative. I'm sure you you make a lot of mistakes and, and learn from them. I can't tell you exactly the right way to do it. But reading other people's code does help. So 
Um, so there was another function in utils besides uh, iter together. We would test that as different functions within that same class, or we would make new classes for that. Yeah, it depends. If, if there's something kind of that are grouping the functionality, so like logically we want to keep those tests together, it might make sense to put them in the same test case, which remember the, the class is called the test case. Mm -hmm. um, especially if, if there's some shared information. So, so for example, in, in PyBell, one of the things that PyBell does is it, it loads up kind of a database and, and it uses that database to do some checking of, of the data that you're putting in. So when you're writing tests, it's actually kind of expensive to load a database every single time you want to run a new function. So if all those functions rely on the same database, I might group them together into a single test case. And that test case loads the database once, and then all the tests can run versus that database. This is a really, really common uh, example for grouping these things together. So, so that would be one reason. O otherwise, it doesn't really make a difference how you're grouping them. Do it in a way such that it's easier for people to navigate your code, such that you can remember what you did and why. It's, it's really a pain in the butt to go searching for test cases, I gotta tell you. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, and, and Anak also asked, do you use PyTest? I missed it. We haven't, you haven't missed it, we haven't quite got there yet. Um, I'm gonna implement the code, I'm gonna show you that it works, and then I'm going to tell you that everything I did was bad and we're gonna do it better, and then we're gonna introduce PyTest. So hold tight, we're, we're gonna get there really soon. Anyone else? There's a couple of good questions. Uh, I'm happy to keep answering them if, if we uh, are confused until this point. Okay, good, then, then we're gonna implement it. So first thing we need is to open up our files. Is everybody familiar with with? So we want to open up our, our left file as uh, left. Oh, path left or left path? Which is better? I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it. Now we're gonna call it left file. Okay, but you you've done with open before, but did you know that you can do several widths at the same time? This this avoids some unnecessary nesting. Now we do this with thing because we want to make sure the file closes at the end. Okay, so what was the job that we needed to do? We needed to make sure that we're iterating through both of the files at the same time, and we want to split everything apart. So how do we iterate over two things together? Now, maybe, maybe you didn't know this, but files, you can iterate directly over them. So we can do for line in left file, and then maybe we can, I don't know, consume it. We can print the line. We can do for line in right file, and we can print the line. But this doesn't do us any good because the files aren't together. We want to iterate over them at the same time. So we're going to zip them. If you don't know about the zip function, welcome to the future. Because this allows us to iterate over left line and right line. OK, so now we've got the left line and the right line. We need to do some stuff to them because we know they're coming from a file. So we need to deal with all the stupid stuff that comes with a file. We need to strip away the, the new line at the end, and we need to split based on a comma. We need to do the same thing with right line. OK. Now, we're going to write the function wrong. We're going to assume that it's only two, line, uh, two, two columns. And so when, when you split something up, you actually get a, a list. And we always know the list is going to be of length, too. So we're going to do left index, left value. Maybe you've never seen tuple unpacking before, but this is pretty cool. We can take that list and we know it's too big and we sort into two different variables. Same thing for right. And then yield. So this is called iter together, not make a list together. We want to yield because we don't want to have to read everything into memory. And we're going to do left idx left value and then write value. And we're going to assume that write IDX is the same as left IDX. So we don't need to use this variable for anything. So did you think you could have done this in one, two, three, four, five lines? I think that's pretty good. Of course, it's not right. It's going to make a mistake if you would give it data that doesn't look exactly like our test. But that's, uh, that's up to us. We're going to have to write better tests. But for now, let's, let's take this implementation and see if it works. So we're going to run our test again. 
and we're going to run our test the bad way, which is by clicking the run test again button in PyCharm. And if it wasn't obvious until now, until now, the issue with me clicking to rerun the test with PyCharm is that it's really unlikely that your computer is set up the same way as mine and that you could just do this. So the test passes. We had, you know, the, the, the foresight that I've already implemented this before and I've already written the tests and I knew what needed to be done. Maybe for you, you're not gonna get the results directly working. And this is a good thing. It means that you've thought about the, the code and you've written some tests for it and now you have to make the implementation match the expectations. But for us, we, we managed to do them both at the same time. So now we're left with the issue that we wrote code, it works, we know how to import it. We even wrote tests that make sure it works correctly. But uh, it's really hard for somebody else to verify that this is true. Wait, the, the question was, wait, you actually do test-driven development? Yes, I actually do test-driven development. Actually, do it. Um, yeah, so, so the problem is we need to make sure other people can run the tests too. And this brings us to the next thing, which is talks. Because we want to make sure that everybody's running the tests the same way. And uh, the way that we're going to use uh, do that is, is with talks. And so we're going to start uh, with the whole new file. It's not a Python file. And um, at this point, we're not going to write any more Python code for the rest of the time that I'm talking. So this is, I hope, what you were expecting, because this isn't about Python code. We've only written enough to, to run our tests. Now we want to use all of the tools that help us to do the best job we can with the stuff that we've written. So we're going to start by creating a talks file. And it's called talks.ini. And it's going to live in the top level just next to the setup and the, the setup config and the setup.py. And it's going to be called talks.ini. And inside your talks file, you don't need a lot of stuff, actually. It's, um, <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but uh, INI also stands for configuration file. Um, I don't remember what INI stands for. It's, it's one of these old Windows terms, but we're, it's going to have the same format as setup.cfg. And in the top, we'll just have to do something called test. Env. And inside our, our test env, we, we give it a little bit of configuration on how to run code that we want it to run. And right now, uh, and I does not mean initiate, I don't think. Yes? Oh, cool. Thank you. So, so inside, inside our test env, remember we do like keys and values. We're going to give it a little bit of information on how we want it to run our unit tests. So to do that, we do Okay, the, the question was, what's the tox file used for? I'm going to answer that in one second. So we're going we're gonna to say commands equals pytest tests. All right. I think this is enough. This is almost enough. Okay, we need to do one more thing. We need to do deps equals pytest. Okay, we should also write it this way. So, so Pallavi's question was, what does PyTest, what's it used for? And, and the job of, oh, sorry, what's Tox used for? Um, the job of the Tox file is to let us configure things that we would run in the command line in, in a very simple way to make sure it's as reproducible as possible. So every time that you want to write some, some commands for writing tests, you know, whether it's running unit tests or, or some other things, which we're going to get to very soon, um, we can we can make a set of commands. These are the things that would be run in the command line. Um, before those commands get run, though, we we probably want to do a couple of things. We want to install the the package itself, it or together. Tox, Tox takes care of that automatically for you every time because it knows you're in a Python world and it knows that you're doing Python packaging, so it knows to install that code. Um, on top of the code that it takes to install it or together, it's also going to install pytest because PyTest isn't necessary to run the iter together code, but it is necessary to run the tests because PyTest is, is a command line function actually. So, so when, when it says deps, it actually runs pip install PyTest. And when you pip install PyTest, you get this command line uh, interface for PyTest. So we run it that way. You could also write it like this, python-m PyTest because PyTest is also a module. Um, yeah, this is this is basically it. So so now I'm going to come back to the the terminal, and we did a couple things in the terminal before. So it will install pytest while you're pip installing iter together. No, um, it will install iter together, and then it will install pytest separately. Writing configuration in tox.ini does not change the configuration for the setup.cfg. 
So this talks to ionize some extra special sauce that goes on top of the fact that you already wrote a Python package. Let me demonstrate by just running Tox. The first thing you need to do is pip install Tox. There's no way around that one. But the cool thing about Tox is it takes care of creating a virtual environment for you in which it installs your package, it or together, and it also installs PyTest because we added it to this depths. And all you have to do is run Tox and it's going to figure out what to do. You can, I hope you can all see that. It's, uh, it's creating a virtual environment. It's running the setup file. It's installing the extra dependencies. Um, yeah, so, so that was a really good question from Shannon. She asked, uh, is pip installing talks mostly what package developers do, not end users? Correct. When you pip install NumPy, you don't necessarily install all the tests and you don't run the tests yourself. However, if you'd like to, you might be able to, to run all the tests because NumPy probably uses something like Tox as well. Um, so, so yeah, you don't need to run the tests to, to use code. You don't even need to have, have tests for code to be working, but you know, this is something that we can use to check to make sure that it's good. So this is more of a developer tool. And, and for the rest of the time that we're talking, we're gonna be talking just about developer tools and not about stuff that end users would use. Um, so in which scenario would I want to use Tox? I, do, I don't need virtual env to test code. The correct, the, the answer is yes. Um, you, you don't, or sorry, you don't necessarily need a virtual environment to test your code. However, the fact that Tox um, makes a virtual environment for each kind of test might make a little more sense when we start adding stuff to our Tox file later. So let's just uh, bask for a moment that now we now have a very simple system for running our tests, which nobody can mess up because all you have to do is pip install Tox and then run Tox. And then all the stuff happens that you're expecting to happen. You get it, uh, it finds all the tests, it runs them. It gives you some nice happy green messaging, says congratulations, and you get a smiley face. Um, and then, yeah, we're happy. So, so now, now anybody who, who gets the code, who downloads it from, from Git, they can, they can just write talks and all the stuff that you want them to be able to do will just happen for them because you've given the right configuration. And this is really supporting everybody doing everything because it's so hard to, to get the configuration right if it's not explained and it's not written out. So that's why we're doing this. Okay. Is everyone happy until now? We, we've structured our code. We've implemented something. We, we figured out how to make our structure inside our packaging so the user gets the functions they want. We, we've written all the metadata down for actually doing the installation. We've written tests that go with it. We've even got something that runs all of our tests for us so we don't even have to think about how they get run. We never have to think about it again because it's in our talks file. We just have to write talks every time we change our code and it checks, did I mess something up? Nope, the code still passes. I'm good, time to push. What's next? So there's quite a bit of stuff in this list. We've got, we've got um, introducing Tox, adding our first environment to Tox to INA, that's a check. The next thing we're gonna talk about is Pyroma, and then Travis, and then finishing our setup.config. And uh, oh, we did some stuff out of order, mm, that's okay. Okay, then, then we're gonna do Pyroma and we're gonna take our, our mid uh, session break in about five minutes. So Anak asked, if I need to add an argument, I need to change the code. Yeah, if you wanna change the way that the tests are run, then you do need to change this, uh, this tox file. If you need to add arguments to the Python function, then you would go and change the code. And then you might also have to change the tests as well. But um, yeah, maybe I misunderstood the question. Well, let's come back to that later. So, um, you know, I put a lot of focus on until now, making sure that the right metadata was available so other people could figure out what's going on. And, and that sort of is on the different levels. So they need to be able to install the code. They need to test that it actually does what it's supposed to, which presupposes you've written tests. And they need to have configuration for running those tests. And we've automated all of that until now. Um, what else do packages like NumPy or Pandas do that's really, really useful? Let's, um, let's hop over to, to PyPI and check this one out. Switch to Safari, share. Okay, can you see my Safari? Oh. Yep. Great, okay. So let's go to NumPy's page on, on, on PyPI. Maybe you've never actually looked at PyPI, but this is the front end website for all of the stuff. 
So what do they have? They've got the name of the package. They've got the version. We've done all that already. But look at, there's all this extra information. There's like a, a one line banger that explains what it is. There's like this readme. And then there's all this other stuff. Like it tells you where the home page is. It tells you how to download it. It's got links to the source code on GitHub. And it has information like, here's the license. Here's the author. Here's the maintainer. That's sometimes not the same person. And information like, how, how can you run this on Python? Like, are there requirements? And then some other stuff like this runs on, you know, this is a Mac OS and Microsoft and POSIX and Unix safe software and it's stable. So all this other metadata that goes, excuse me, with the package, uh, I want to show you how to add this information because this makes it easier for other people to, to find your code, to get it or to use it or, or some combination of all of those. And that's again, the focus of what we're doing here. So we're going to hop back to PyCharm. And we're going to make, um, we're not going to make a new file. Great. We don't have to make a new file. We're going to make a new environment within talks. So it turns out that if you want to have other configurations for running other tests, you can add them in here. You need headers just like test env, but you're going to start putting colons after them. So this one is going to be called pyroma. Now you'll see that pyroma has the colon and then the name after it. And this first one doesn't have anything. So the one that doesn't have anything after it is like the default test environment. Pyroma is going to be the non-default one, but we're still going to run it. And we have to tell it a little bit of information about what we want to run and how. So I'm going to copy paste this. I'm going to copy paste it better. So the command we want to run, well, first we want to install Pyroma. This is another Python package. And the job of Pyroma is to check that you have all this nice metadata and to remind you if you don't have the nice metadata, you should add it. And to run Pyroma, you type Pyroma, because it's a command line interface. And then you type dot. Now, that dot means in the current working directory. And remember, tox is in this top level repository uh, directory. So its job is to look at the setup.cfg file that's sitting next to the tox file and to tell you if it's good enough. There's one other thing that we can add into into the configuration for the pyroma run, and that's this skip install equals true. Now, when we run our unit tests, we need to install the code. It makes no sense to run unit tests on the code if the code isn't there. However, for pyroma, we don't actually have to install the code to run pyroma. We only have to look at this one setup.cfg. So we say skip install equals true to save ourselves a little bit of time and effort. Now, there's, there's two ways to run this non-default test. The first way we could do it, I hope you can all see the bottom of my, my screen right here. You type um, tox, and tox has this extra flag called dash E. And then you can tell it which environment you want it to run. So you can type pyroma. And then it looks, and it finds the test stem that has pyroma after it, and it runs it. So let's see how we do. All right, so what did it do? It installed Pyroma, and then it ran Pyroma, and now it gave us a bunch of output. It says it's checking dot, okay, so it knows that the package is called iter together, that's good, but it's upset. The package has no description. The package's long description is quite short. There's no classifiers. We're missing Python versions. Your package doesn't have keywords. Your package doesn't have author data, emails. There should be a URL. You should have a license, and you should say what development status is. Now, if you take nothing away from this talk, you should take away the, the knowledge that PyPI is also called the cheese shop. It's called the cheese shop because there's a lot of Monty Python references everywhere in the Python community, as the name comes from Monty Python. And um, the cheese shop was one of the sketches they did. And so everything about the PyPI being the cheese shop means that we're going to make lots of cheese jokes everywhere. So at the end, Pyroma says uh, it gives a rating to your, your package, which is a cheese wheel. And this cheese seems to contain no dairy products. It's not very much cheese at all. Perhaps it's the cheese that they eat in Heston, um, which doesn't really have much cheese in it. So we need to make some updates. We need to add things to our setup.cfg because it's sorely lacking in metadata right now. And then eventually we're going to have better rated cheeses, which is what we want, right? No, Dorito dust. Oh yeah, yeah, Dorito dust isn't cheese. So right now it's Dorito dust. 
Okay, so we're going to come back to our setup.cfg and we're going to start adding lots of wonderful stuff into it. And I'm going to do it very, very quickly and maybe not explain at the time because I want, uh, I want us to all take the break uh, sooner rather than later. So the first thing we would add is a description. This comes under the, the name and this is probably the same thing that we've written in our init file. So I'm going to copy paste it from that. The next thing is the long description. Now the cool thing about the long description is we can tell it we just want it to use the readme file. Um, remember we had this kind of magical find command earlier? This is also similar to that. The magical file command says just read in this file. Okay, the next thing we need is a URL. I'm gonna go and check what the URL was for this package. Okay, that's the URL. Uh, we need the author, that's me. Happily Hoyt. Uh, we need the author email. I know a lot of people in academia get kind of annoyed when they're putting their, oh, okay, we'll come back to that in one sec. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't share their emails like very readily in, in academia, but because I use Gmail, it's really good at filtering all the spam out, so I don't mind sending it everywhere. I haven't got any weird emails yet. One of you could be the first. Um, okay, so there's also the maintainer email. Maybe we don't, yeah, we'll keep it up. Okay, so we have information about the maintainer. Um, you wanna have information about the license. Now there's two parts to this. There's the license and the license file. So remember way back in the beginning, we actually had GitHub automatically create this MIT license. So when it does that, it uses the name of your GitHub uh, user. So I'm gonna change this to Charles Tapley Hoyt before we start pushing this. And the license file, you just write the name of the license file which is license, no file extension. Um, and this is the part that's also a little hand wavy, the license, you write MIT. There is a controlled vocabulary for which licenses get you know, annotated well here, but I don't know where that controlled vocabulary is. So if you're using MIT, it's obvious you just use MIT because this is something I'm telling you works. If you're using Apache 2.0, I think you can just write Apache. Um, you're going to be on your own with this one. So just use easy licenses and then you'll have problems. All right, what else do we need? We need classifiers. And remember, this was, this was the thing where it said like development status for beta. Like, I don't know, there's a couple of different ones. There's like pre-alpha and alpha and beta. And then there's like production ready. And then there's, uh, I think, one of them is like no longer maintained or something like that. And then, you know, you can, you can say something like uh, what the license is. Um, all these classifiers do come from a controlled vocabulary. Um, and I look it up every time because I can't remember. So Google, you know, Python, Trove, classifiers. I just typed it into the chat so you have it. You know. Yeah, these, these are hard to remember. I'm not magical. I have a second screen where I have these all written down that I'm copying it off of. So, so one of the other important ones is that you say what the programming language is. Programming languages. Um, it's kind of weird because we're like using Python already. It should kind of know that we're doing Python programming. But you, you can also say specifically which ones you're supporting. So this is supporting Python 3.8 and Python 3.7 and Python 3.6 and against my will, it's supporting Python 3.5 because we didn't do anything funny. Nah, come on, it's not Python 3.5. Um, and then under classifiers, you can add keywords. Keywords uh, can be whatever you want. This is a good place for you to write down some short things that people might search for. So I'm gonna write iteration, file utilities. I don't know, those, those just are what came to mind. You can put whatever you want. All right. Um, let's see how we're doing on, on, uh, on Pyroma now. Did we get everything it wanted? Oh, 
were really good. We got rating nine out of 10 cottage cheese, but it says that our long description is quite short. Hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna delete some of these things and I wanna see what some of the other cheeses are because our time is not that valuable. Okay, this is Comte. Anyone uh, French can, can pronounce that properly and, and correct me. Okay. So to, to get the best cheese, we need to update our, our package uh, long description. Now remember the long description comes from the readme. So we're probably gonna wanna add some extra stuff here. What should go in our readme is information useful for the person who's, who's going to be using the code. So we probably want to copy paste that, that one liner. We probably want to give some information about how to install. We probably want to tell them something about the documentation. We probably want to tell them how to use the package like really quickly. Um, I'm not going to write all this out right now, but the way that you get the code is you get clone HTTPS something, 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 something. And then you cd into this folder that as you cloned it, and then you do pip install. Um, okay, I'm going to get to this question in one second. Oh, thank you, Olivier. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to read all this documentation stuff up because we haven't got to that. We're going to get to that after the break. Um, this is this is how you would, maybe you're not familiar with restructured text, but this is how you make a code block. Um, so yeah, if you want to download and install it in development mode, do this in your favorite shell. Okay, let's see if, uh, if that was enough to make Pyroma happy. Yes, my cheese is so fresh that people think it's cream. Mascarpone. I hope you all know what mascarpone is, it's really good. So up until now, we've created the package structure, we've implemented some Python uh, functions, we've tested those Python functions, we've got all the metadata we need to make sure that our package can install, and even further than that, we've got enough metadata that somebody might be able to use it. We've got the information about how to run the tests inside our tox file, and it's obvious how the tox file should be run, but it's not in the documentation, so let's add that. Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to make a little bit of updates. So um, I think it's a good time for a break because you can only listen to my voice for so long before you start to hate me. Um, I'm gonna make a push to GitHub. Let's take like 10 minutes. Everyone can, can give a good stretch. Everyone can come back, uh, bring, bring your favorite beer, cider, wine, or whatever. As they say in Germany, kein Bier vor vier. In the United States, we say it's five o'clock somewhere. So <laughs> at, at any time, it's, it's okay to, to take a drink. Um, yeah, so so let's say, okay, I'll give you 12 minutes. It's going to be at 19.50 for me, and uh, East Coast, it's going to be, okay, math, 13.50, so 1.50. We'll, we'll come back, and then we'll try and get through the rest of this stuff. I, I will hang out, though, for a couple of minutes, so anyone who wants to ask some specific questions during the break, that's that's fine. Oh, and yeah, at the end of the talk, of course, I'll share all of my information with everybody one more time. You're all free to... to you know, bug me about this stuff and ask questions after the talk. I'd be happy to help. So yeah, let's let's take a break. I'm gonna go get a, a drink, and then yeah, I, I'll answer whatever questions people have written. I know there were a couple already, and I'll, I'll get to those. So I'm gonna stop the share for a second. I'm gonna turn off my video, and then yeah, good. Sounds great. See you in ten minutes.
Here's um, okay. We're going to come back to this discussion about requirements as, as soon as we we start, um, and then I, I'll try and help you with that one. And then Alex asked, when do you personally decide to make something a sub package instead of enri enriching the existing package? And um, yeah, yeah, so you can always make more Python files in the same like directory level. And I don't know, I try and, I try and organize the code based on what it's doing. Almost every Python package I've made has like a constants Python file, like at the top level. Almost everyone also has like a utils. And, and sometimes when I start writing lots and lots of utils, um, like I'll, I'll split it to like path utils and, you know, iteration utils, and I don't know, depending on that kind of stuff. I try and make sure that I'm also reusing as much code from other packages as possible. So I'm not trying to write lots of utilities. Um, in PyBell, the, the way that ended up being is I've got, um, I've got a sub package that is describing everything that has to do with the, the database backend that it communicates with. And I've got a sub package that has to do with its parser. And there's lots of code inside each of those that are, that are grouped together. However, it's way too much to be in a single Python file. If, you, if you're going over a thousand lines or 2000 lines in a single Python file, you might wanna consider breaking it up and, and making it more easy for somebody to understand. So, so that's how I ended up doing some sub packages within PyBell. Um, uh, this is a creative choice. You, you gotta use your best judgment. And when you're not sure if your judgment's good or not, then and reading other packages is a good way to do it. Like, don't be scared. Go and read the source code for NumPy. Go read the source code for like, I don't know, if you're using databases, SQL Alchemy is, is, is a nice tool for Python. Try, try reading the code from that. Read the code from uh, Quick. We're gonna talk about Quick in a little bit. This is written by Armin Rohnacker and he writes really, really nice looking code. You can actually learn a lot just by reading stuff that other people have written. Um, I guess the same way you can kind of learn language. Since Python is a language, we, we get some of the same idioms. Uh, all right. So is everyone back? Dan's not back. We can wait for him. you learn from open source. Um, yeah, so so a lot of the configurations and all this stuff, it's it's possible to learn some of it from, how do, how do you have one? <laughs> it's possible to learn some of this stuff from reading in the configuration of other files from other people's projects. Um, you, you can read the blog posts of a lot of the pe people in the core of the community of Python. Uh, most most interesting talks I've ever seen related to the Python programming language are from a guy named David Beasley, who's who's just like taking every weird feature of the language and showing how you can abuse it for amazing and bizarre things. Nothing like necessarily practically useful, but just so you start to learn not just like what Python is, but uh, how how programming kind of fits together and what sort of paradigms are there. Um, that's more about programming itself, though. Um, some some of this other open source stuff, you just kind of pick up because you'll see in a project that somebody's using it. Um, you know, I have this like, yeah, oh, David Beasley. Yeah, go, I, I have, a, I have a, a playlist of all my favorite Python programming talks on YouTube that I'll share with you guys at the end. Um, and, and you can learn a lot from those too. PyCon happens once or twice a year, depending on, on which locations, and they always post all of the talks that people give at those. And, and they range from practical stuff like using Python for data science or, or doing some, some data analysis to language features to uh, exploration of different packages. Like maybe the person who writes each package will go and, and, and give a demo. And then there's also some stuff about the language itself. Usually like some of the core developers will, will give talks and you can learn so much from those. It's kind of a big time investment though. You, you, can, you can pick your favorites and, then, and learn about that. 
Yeah, but one of the other things that's important to like learn a lot about Python is just to get angry when things don't work the right way. And like, if you can't figure out something based on the documentation, like you go into the source code and you figure out what's going on and then, <laughs> code rage. I, I've, I've given more pull requests than, than the code that I've written myself, I think. Um, and, and yeah, you go and, and you do this kind of stuff. I don't know if any of you are like um, fans of, of typography or like calligraphy or that kind of stuff, but there's like this thing that I'm always talking about, uh, it's called kerning. And it's like the space between letters and words. And like, there's an art form to this. And once you are aware of kerning existing and like, you know what it looks like, every time you see bad kerning, it makes you upset. And, and I'm kind of introducing you to this. Uh, oh my God, this, this guy, Yang Jung Kring, I'm, I'm so upset that you just did that. <laughs> Am I Randall Monroe? No, but he's awesome. I love him. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm going to go sidetracked with like monologuing. So let me continue to monologue in a non sidetracked way. So, so when we left off, we had, we had just gotten to kind of a milestone where we got everything sort of running and everything checked. And, and now we're just going to go and bang, 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 all sorts of other different stuff, different kinds of testing configurations, because you can't trust yourself to, to write unit tests. You can't trust yourself to write code that looks good. You can't trust yourself to write, um, to, to run talks every time. So we need tools that are gonna do all this for us. So I'm gonna start screen sharing again, and then we're gonna get back to it. Um, from here on out, I could kind of do any of the stuff that's left in our to-do list in any order. So I think the first one that I wanna do is Travis. Okay, so I'm in the wrong place. No, I'm in the right place. Okay, we need one more configuration file. So we've got our terminal. Remember we, we were running talks and, and then we could run talks dash E and, and add some stuff after talks, talks dash E. But you know what? We want to have talks just run everything for us every time. So we're going to make some updates to our talks file. So it turns out that there's one other thing we can put in our talks file, a header called talks. So we've got configurations for our environments. And now we've got configurations for our configuration environment because yo dog, I heard you like configuration. So the only thing we need to add in our talks configuration right now is something called mflist. I think it's mflist. And we're gonna write pyroma, which corresponds to the name pyroma. And then we've got a special name, pi. Pi corresponds to the default one. Let me double check to make sure that that's correct. Yeah, it is mflist, good. All right, so, so now if I just run talks, it's not just gonna run the default environment, but I've given it the list of all the environments I want it to run in order. And we're gonna see that it runs Pyroma and then it starts running our testing uh, harness as well. Okay, check. All right, um, next one. Uh, let's, let's start testing our code quality because we can't trust ourselves to write the code that's documented the right way. So we're gonna make a new environment called Flake 8. Flake 8 is going to ruin your life. Welcome. So um, let me just copy the configuration over because I think it, it's good enough just to, to reuse everything that's already done at this point. Okay, let's just uh, let's start with this. Okay, so Flake 8 is, is gonna check your code quality. Its job is to check to make sure that you didn't put any spaces in the wrong places. It's going to make sure that your code is basically uh, PEP8 compliant. If you don't know what PEP8 is, that's the Python style guide. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether the style guide itself is, uh, is doctrine or whether it's gospel or if it's just uh, guidelines, as Jeffrey Rush would say. Um, there's some stuff that's not right in Pep8, so we're going to skip some of Pep8. But Flakegate's job is to kind of check that stuff. The cool thing about Flakegate is that you can keep adding more plugins for Flakegate to check more things. And if you're a crazy person like me, eventually your, your plugin list has this many entries in it. 
Um, <laughs> and the, the problem with this is it means that there's a lot of rules in how you're supposed to write your Python code. I think this is a good thing. I think it's especially good to, to have a big set of rules on how the code should look when you're working with a group of people, because it is the case that everybody has their own style. And um, enforcing these rules doesn't really stop people from, from being creative in the way that they write code or, or having style in the way that they write code, but it does make sure that there is some important things that are standardized across everything. One of the most important ones is uh, this PyDoc style. This makes sure that everybody writes documentation the same way and that they follow the rules of uh, using the imperative language instead of the passive voice or some other grammatical structures. Um, and, and you know, this just makes it so every time you read documentation, you don't have to think a little bit more. And it means that you can spend less time on stuff that doesn't matter. This is why Steve Jobs always wore the same black turtleneck, I guess. Um, so anyway, if you're a crazy person, you end up with a big long list like this, or you're an even crazier person and you just uh, take it from me for granted. Um, so, so what we do is we, we give this whole list of dependencies. Before we were just giving one at a time, but now you can see there's a bunch. Um, Flakegate doesn't actually have to install the code to, to be run, but we do have to tell Flakegate where the code is. So we tell it source, iter together. We can even have Flakegate check the setup.py file. And uh, I haven't done it until now, but you can actually add a description to any given talks environment, just so anyone who's reading it can, can figure out what, what is this. So if you didn't know, it runs the Flake 8 tool with several plugins. I guess it doesn't help to All right. Um, then we're going to go back up here, and we're going to add Flake 8 to our env list. And then we're going to run our talks again, and we're going to have a whole new configuration checking out all sorts of new stuff for us. And because our code is compiling, we can take a take a step back, we can go play with our swords, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so Flake 8, commands failed. So we're gonna have to scroll back up and it says, hey, what are you doing? Uh, this, this, um, this thing is imported, but it's not used. And you're missing a doc string, how could you? So let's fix the doc string. Remember I said this is a minimal two line file? I lied, you need a doc string, setup module. Okay, and then it has this other thing, it are together imported but not you but unused. Okay, so um, here's the way that you get around that. Oh, I don't want to. Okay, yeah, I don't I don't like this rule. So so this is an exception to the rule. The only place where this rule doesn't apply is inside the init.py file, but there isn't really a good way to say that the rule doesn't apply here. So if you decide, which you shouldn't do this often, you should only do it in very special cases. If you decide that a rule shouldn't apply, you can put a little comment that says no QA, and then you give the name of the error code, and then it won't show the error in Flake 8 anymore. But I've given you this great power to ignore Flake 8. Do not use it. Only, only, only use it for this case right here, please. Because if you just ignore the, the warnings that it's giving you, then it's not really pushing you towards writing better code. All right, so let's run. Well, we don't have to run all of talks. We can just run the flake gate environment with this dash E thing, so it goes a little faster. And now we're passing flake gate. Well, we didn't write very much complicated code, right? So we've, we've done a pretty good job with writing our doc strings the correct way the first time. Let me, let me make some mistakes. Let me add some. This function opens. So I changed it from being imperative mood to being like a normal statement. And if you run flake eight, it's gonna get upset. And it's gonna say, hey, first line should be in the imperative mood. Try rephrasing. Again, this seems like something only a picky person like Charlie would ask for, but you know what? It saves everyone a lot of time and effort. So we're gonna do it. All right. Um, flake eight's a little bit of a problem because it gives these messages and they're kind of hard to read and they're kind of hard to understand. I can't help you with the understanding, but I can help you with how hard to read they are. So what we're gonna do is add a little bit of extra configuration for Flake 8. We're gonna copy paste that from one of the other repositories because this is a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're gonna make another file called .flake8. 
uh, FOIA gateways in the top level next to your setup.config, your setup.py, and your talks.ini. By the end of this, we're going to have a lot of files sitting around there. So this, this is, yeah, I'm not going to explain all of it. It just makes some nice, pretty formatting. So now um, let's go and make that error happen again. OK, now we get nice colored output that's easier to read. Good. OK, flake gate's done. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be up to you to, to learn a little bit more about all the errors that Flategate gives. So uh, do your best to, to kind of figure those out and, and read through the packages one at a time and, and look at the documentation they have. But it should be obvious for most of them. Okay, next thing I want to do is, is Travis, which means I have to, I have to push this to, to GitHub. Yeah, give me one second. So I'm going to have to edit the Git configuration. Mm. Okay, good. So I just I just pushed all the code that we've got so far into to GitHub. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna switch us over to Safari and we're gonna look at what I'm doing there. I have to find Safari. Here we go. Okay. So um, yeah, we're looking in Safari, and then uh, what we want to do is we want to actually start adding Travis to, to run our talks file for us every time. So here's what we've got so far. Um, we need to go to travis-ci.com. And the cool thing about Travis is all we have to do is sign up with our GitHub account. Sign up with GitHub. I'm going through this a little fast because you should be able to kind of do that all on your own. And when, once you've done this, uh, it kind of knows you have to, it tells you how to activate it. You just click activate and then you hit approve. And then it gives you this nice little animation. And then I guess we have to activate one more time because GitHub has a couple different levels and then we save. Okay, I think we're good. Now, now we can see uh, my repository and my account that I made just for this, it or together is there. And if we click on it, it's going to say there's no builds. Okay, that's fine. But why don't we make some updates and then it'll start making builds for us every time we push. Uh, and the question was, is this similar to Jenkins? Yes, it's exactly the same thing as Jenkins. It's just open source and they're hosting it for us. And it's also their own software, but it does the same thing. A continuous integration services job is to wait for you to make a push to your repositories on GitHub. And then it sees automatically that you made a change. And then it downloads all your code and it runs all the tests that you want it to run. So all we have to do is tell it, how do we run the tests that we want it to run? Well, good news, we've already got talks. So we only have to do one thing. We have to make a file called .travis .yml. YML stands for YAML and YAML means YAML ain't markup language. It's similar to JSON similar to config files. Some, some people enjoy this one a little bit more, so that's why some services have it and some don't. Um, oh, hold on, I gotta switch back to PyCharm, sorry. Okay, oh, that's the wrong PyCharm tool. Okay, here we go. Now we just need to put some stuff in our Travis YAML file to tell it what to do. This part should be really easy. Um, we need to tell it that the language we're using is Python. We need to tell it uh, that the Python version we're using is 3.8. We need to tell it to install some stuff. So we want it to pip install talks. Uh, when we want it to run, we need to tell it to install to run talks. And then we're done. We spent all that time making our, our tests totally um, reproducible that the configuration for Travis seems like a no-brainer. 
we just have to tell it to install Tox and then run Tox every time. And, and that's also keeping in mind that Travis's job, the first thing that it does is it pulls your whole Git repository and it's sitting inside the working directory. So these things all fit together so nicely. That's why I like Tox, because Tox makes this so simple. Um, now, of course, this is the simplest version of all of this. There's so many more complex parts to Tox and to Travis that can do really powerful things. We've only got a couple, <laughs> we've only got about 45 more minutes. Um, so, so I'm going to have to cut some stuff short because, yeah, this thing always takes longer than I think it's going to. Uh, let's try doing git commit and add this. Oh, I guess I have to git add. What is it? Git add star. I don't know how Git works. Do you guys use Git? Like, I just use the 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 desktop thing for everything. All right, I'm going to the desktop. Git add dash dash all. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, and then Git commit m add Travis config, and then Git push. Yeah, good. Okay, this looks like it's working right. Great. PyCharm Git. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not getting involved with that. Yeah, I'm going to keep doing stuff the silly way because I'm not smart enough for the other things. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to, to the, the window for, yeah, okay, here we go. Back to Safari. Travis, can you guys see Safari now? You should see this really wonderful thing that happened. I didn't even refresh the window and it already just did this. We can see that it's it's figured out that we've made a push and uh, it's it's doing some stuff already. We didn't even have to, I mean, yeah, we don't even have to know what it's doing. It just figured out, okay, let's install Tox and let's start running it. Now you can see it's doing exactly what we had it doing on our computer. So first it did Pyroma, now it's doing Flake 8. It's a little bit of a problem because it has to install all the stuff from Flake 8, so it takes you know a couple of seconds. Now it's doing the, the testing with PyTest. Okay, two path. And now we've got nice green, you're good. All right, so. Uh, a question that Anak had was, will Git push fail if the tests fail? The answer is no. You're allowed to make whatever changes you want and push to, to Git. And it's okay if the tests are failing. It might even make sense to start pushing code before the tests are failing. Um, it's going to run the tests every time you make a push, unless you tell it not to. Uh, you can make it contingent if you want, though, right? Um, can you, can you uh, elaborate, please? You, like, do you want to make it so you can't push unless the tests are passing? That would be cool. Okay, I'm not going to get to that, but uh, the tool that will allow you to create that scenario is called pre-commit. You guys can uh, you guys can can Google that one. And pre-commit is kind of cool. It depends what you can you can pick little bits of this configuration to force people to use before they make commits. But in general, uh, this this talk isn't about Git workflows. But you you would want to make like a branch where you're working, and you can you can make pushes when the code isn't ready yet, and you know it might be causing the tests to fail. And uh, yeah, you're not gonna ask them to merge back into your master branch until everything's passing. So, you know, it depends. These are, these are kind of up to you, how you wanna have your team work. So yeah, pre-commit's the tool that can help you solve that problem. Okay. So, you know, we spent all that time before the break making sure that the, the package was set up in a way such that we, we could have this testing basically automated on our computers. And, and now we have it set up in a way such that it can be automated on someone else's computer. And, and this means that we can enforce our will, you know, with all of our testing and all of our style guides on anybody who's working with us. And uh, you, can, you can enforce it so much that people don't wanna work with you anymore. So um, I could end the talk right there and everyone would be upset, yeah. <laughs> The next thing that we want to, to talk about though, because I'm not, I'm not done. Of course, there's lots more stuff to, to do. Um, I want to tell you guys about requirements, and then and then I want to do the doc the docs stuff. And if we don't get to the command line stuff, and we don't get to to pushing to PyPI and Zenodo, then that's yeah, that's too bad. But you know, maybe I can make another video with just me talking. Um, 
Yeah, and then of course the important thing is the one true test, which we're not going to get to do because not everyone got the chance to follow along. Um, so, so yeah, we've got let's say we've got forty five minutes left, and we're going to make the best use of this time. I'm going to show everybody how to set up uh, documentation, and you know, kind of the same idea with the unit tests is we want to make sure. Uh, I can write articles on my website. Yes, I already have written articles on my website for everything. You can you can read up on that um, <laughs> if we didn't quite make it to it now. Um, okay, so so yeah, we're going to do the same thing that we just did for unit testing, but we're going to do it for documentation. We want to make sure that the documentation can be sort of sucked out of the Python code and put into a nice format and, and displayed to people using a program called Spanx. And then uh, we're going to do the same thing that we kind of did with Travis CI. We're going to ask um, a website called Read the Docs to, to do the same thing that Travis CI is doing, but for the documentation. So every time we make updates to our code, it rebuilds the documentation and it makes a website for us. Um, this is definitely the most powerful thing about you know doing all the stuff in an automated way is, is all of these tools can be totally up to date at all times and you don't have to do anything. So- Charlie, quick question. Yeah? Um, if you have to load, what, what if you have to load a bunch of packages every time when you're doing your test uh, with Travis CI, does that become really cumbersome and is there any way around that? Yeah, so, so one of the things you can do is you, you get this cache. Yeah, exactly. That's one thing. So, so then, then you don't have to worry about all this pip install stuff because it remembers that you're doing these installs every time. Mm -hmm. and, and it might even save the tox cache. Uh, in general, you know, this is, this is a tricky thing is you want your tests to, to run with as little code as possible and you want your tests to run as fast as possible but um yeah again this is you have to come up with creative solutions sometimes uh you're gonna have to write tests that take a long time to run for example i, I also help maintain a machine learning package for knowledge graph embeddings and our tests you know run the knowledge graph embedding on sample data and it takes like you know three minutes for every test so mm -hmm. overall it takes like 45 minutes to run the tests or you can parallelize it um, because some tests don't rely on each other or, or most tests don't, but you know, some, some things are just more expensive than others. And, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a software developer by trade, right? Like if you talk to people who, who consider themselves software developers and they work at companies whose bottom line is software developing and their bottom line isn't science, they have, they have a lot of thoughts on this stuff. And, uh, these are interesting people to listen to. So, so you might want to think about, listening to talks that are actually outside of the Python world for, for this kind of stuff. And then the other question is, um, is this stuff cached on Travis CI? Yeah, Travis is really good at caching stuff because a lot of people are asking for the same resources. Like everyone wants to install NumPy. So NumPy is going to be on their file system ready to go, like set up in a way that we can't even comprehend as tiny scientists. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of other other ways to, to deal with testing when you when you've got bigger tests and, and I don't want to talk about that because for a lot of the stuff we're going to do these will be sufficient but you know what we're also talking to the corona y group we're talking to scientists and, and the kind of test that you're going to run might be like does my analysis still uh, support the same conclusion that it did you know two years ago with this old data set that's a, a different kind of world I don't know I don't have a good solution for that off the top of my head but but there's a lot of people thinking about it so, so let's not dwell on that. Let's kind of move on and, and maybe we can talk about that at the end again. So the next thing I wanted to show you guys was um, requirements. Yeah, this is, this is important. Emily. If I forgot requirements, we'd be really, really out of luck. So, so right now we've written a package that actually doesn't have any um, requirements, right? It just runs with the stuff that's in the Python standard library. But of course the code we're writing is always going to use something like NumPy or pandas or, or you know, you know, whatever library requests. So another one that's really popular. So we actually have to come back to our setup.cfg file to tell what the requirements are. And we're gonna to go to our options. And I always put this one first. We have install requires equals. And now we can put a list requests, numpy, pandas, pybell, whatever. I'm using pybell a lot here, probably not going to. This is the place where you list all the things that your code needs to run. Okay, now here's the thing. You've probably written requirements.txt before, or, or if you've been using Conda, there's, there's this Conda um, environment YAML file that, that has this information in it. When you're writing your code as a Python package, this is the place where you need to put all that information. No more requirements.txt. You only need a requirements.txt if you're just writing scripts and you just want to convey this information to people. Like these are the things you need installed. Like you're kind of on your own. 
but we don't want to leave people on their own. We want to make sure that the code we write is exactly installable the way that it should be. And, and this is how we you know, do that in the structured way is we use this options installs required. So, you know, it's much, much like the requirements.txt, you can also specify something like version numbers. You can be like, I want version 1.2 point whatever. And maybe pandas, you're, you're way back in the past and you're not ready for pandas 1.0. So you say, all right, I want less than equal to 25.0 because pandas just jumped from version 25 to being version 1.0.0 or something like that. Yeah. So this is a place where you can, you can make some specification for the version numbers. Um, all right, good. And, and so the difference between um, setup.py, setup.cfg, and then requirements.txt is the setup.py file's job is to read the configuration. The setup.cfg has all the configuration for requirements for where the code is and everything. And requirements.txt is, is not uh, appropriate for when we are packaging our Python code. And because it's my opinion that we should always package our Python code almost no matter what, there almost is no place where requirements.txt is appropriate. So this is sort of a relic of a bygone era, as they say. Um, there might be, yeah, oh. Oh, great, there's a, there's a comment that has information specifically about this. So thank you, Anak, for, for sharing that. Um, okay, so good, we're, we're, we're now at requirement nirvana and it's it's time to do the the docs because time time is running short and this would be the most helpful for the most people because now i want to start pushing you after you've done a good job writing code it's it's not good enough you need to make sure other people can use it so it needs to be documented and you want to make writing documentation as easy as possible so we're going to use sphinx to do that and and the way to get started with sphinx is we're going to make a directory called docs and by the way, you should always call your directory docs because this is one of our community standards and everyone expects it's going to be in a folder called docs, especially read the docs. And then we're going to go into this docs and we're going to have to run something called Sphinx quick start. We have to install Sphinx first. So we're going to pip install Sphinx. Okay. And Sphinx installs quite a bit of stuff. It takes a minute, hopefully not too long. Good. And then we get this function, this uh, command line automatically installed for us called Sphinx Quick Start. And we run that and it's going to ask us a couple questions and it's going to, uh, yeah. So, so separate source and build directories, always separate these things. I don't like that the default is the other thing. Um, our project is called iter, uh, iter dash together. This is the place where you want to stylize your name. So maybe you have capitalization, but iter together is going to be all lowercase. You can put in the author name. Oh, I guess I better put Charles. Um, okay, this is the place where, again, we have to put our, our version. And I promise we're going to come back to this version thing, Will. And then the language is in English. Okay, good. So it kind of has everything that, that you would need to build the documentation. So at this point, we're inside the docs folder. And, and there's, there's a folder called build. There's a folder called source. And then there's a make file and a make.bat. Ew. No Windows support, delete, no more make.bat. Okay, so, um, so what you can do is you can type make. So, so most people should have make installed in the system. And make is also another general build system. Um, it's like tox, but it's for everything. We don't have to look into what's in the make file because it's already set up for us. So we can type make HTML and it's going to do some stuff for us. It's going to look into the conf.py file that it created which tells it how to do the building of the documentation. It's going to look at this index and it's going to make our, our documentation. So then we just have to open build HTML index to HTML. And you can't see what I'm looking at, can you? Let me switch. All right. Um, there's a question, do we need to run quick start each time we run Sphinx? No, nope, you only have to run quick start one time. And from then on, you just have to run the make HTML command. And you should be able to see now we're in Firefox. Uh, this is what it built, kind of a, a boring. Oh, it was just failed in the. F huh. All right, I'm going to look into that one. Um, what name should we put for an org like Corona Y? Uh, hold on. So, so really quick, this is just the, the automatic boilerplate stuff that gets built. And I just want to show you how to include 
code that comes out of your package into this. And then I think that's enough for, for documentation. You can, you can learn a little bit more about Sphinx on your own. And I, I've, uh, in the Corona-wide repositories, I've also added it, a little bit of extra information. Um, what, should, what should be put for an org like Corona-wide? Um, can, you, can you elaborate? Like, who, who should be the author? Like, should you put Corona-wide as the author? Or, yeah, I don't know. We should, we should for Corona-wide, um, sort of agree on that, I think. Dan and, and some of the other guys who are, who are uh, owning the, the Git organization should decide how they want that to be, and then they can make it um, standard. I don't know. I think it'd be okay just to write Corona Y. Uh, for, for most of the packages that I write, I always write my name. Um, you know, if you're working at a university, the university may have some kind of oppressive, restrictive things, like you have to put the university's name, or maybe you have a really awful professor that says that you have to put their name. Um, don't do any of that stuff until somebody forces you to. Always use your name for everything until someone tells you you're not allowed to because most people won't check and then it won't matter. And then you don't have to worry about it ever. So uh, don't tell anybody that I said that, even though this is going up on YouTube, I'm sure nobody that would be in a place where they care about that stuff is going to watch this video. All right, so let's do it. Let's, let's get our, our documentation out of our Python code and into this automatically. And then we can be pretty happy that we've kind of gone through the whole gamut. So I'm gonna switch back to PyCharm now. I'm gonna to try to do this pretty quick. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that, that's happened in the last couple of years is this conf.py file has gotten worse. It has a lot less stuff in it than it used to. You know, it's just kind of short. Um, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna copy paste verbatim from, from the repository that I already filled out all of the configuration. Um, and, and I'm going to go through it very, very fast with you, you know, in comparison to all of this other stuff, which wasn't very fast. And, and, and for you, you know, this might mean that you just want to copy paste over and over again from stuff you've done before, like I do, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, at the top of this, uh, the first thing to know, actually, that's it's kind of bizarre about this is that the configuration that's used for, for your building of your documentation is a Python file. But this Python file isn't run as a Python file. It's actually like imported and evaluated inside another Python file. So you can inject all sorts of really weird stuff here. Um, so yeah, one of the things that we're going to have to do, unfortunately, is we're going to have to go back to this thing that we tried to get away from, which is messing with the system path. And so we have to tell it that the, the code for the package is actually inside the source directory over here. Unfortunately, we can't, uh, we can't rely on the, the Python packaging for this part. So um, just, just accept that that's how it is. And uh, yeah, you use this. There's this other part of, of the configuration called extensions. And there's a lot of really good stuff here. One of the most important ones is Autodoc. This is the one that lets us start importing our Python codes documentation and putting it there automatically. The other one that's really important is Autodoc type hints. This is the one that takes all the stuff out of the type annotations that we talked about already two hours ago. And it'll also put that into your documentation for you automatically. And then there's this, um, this other one for click, which we're gonna come back to when we do command line interfaces, if we have time, if we go really, really fast. Okay, and then there's a bunch of other boilerplate code in here. Luckily, uh, I copy pasted it from the other repository and the names are already correct. Um, there's also this thing that, that kind of parses up the version number, which, and then it has this code right here, which you'll notice is like invalid code, but this tags uh, variable is actually going to be available within the Python file that evals this. So this is okay, even though it's not technically a valid Python file. Yeah. Okay. And then it's kind of scrolling down. We, we do a couple other things. We tell it we want to use the read the docs theme here. We tell it that we want to use something called intersphinx. And way down in the bottom, oh boy. Yeah, so intersphinx allows us to link from our documentation to other documentation. This makes it much, much richer experience for readers to jump back and forth when they see stuff that you don't understand. And then, you know, there's this other stuff, which is what you want for read the docs. And yeah, I don't know why, why you need that. It just is something that the read the docs uh, documentation said you should use. So lesson learned from this is just copy paste this and be very careful to change all the information every time you do it to make sure it's the right name for your package. Or as somebody very astutely pointed out in the beginning, there's a tool for making package templates called Cookie Cutter, which could also be used for, for 
a repository like this. All right, we've done that. We've got all the configuration correct. Now I just wanna give a very minimal example of how to import some of our code. So we're gonna to go to this index.rst and this is all ready to go. There's, you can kind of put whatever you want. It's a restructured text file, but there is this table of contents. So the first thing I wanna do before the table of contents is I wanna import the documentation from the init file. Remember the init file is this just top level one with a very short doc string. And I think that's an important thing to have at the top of the documentation. And I wanna show you that you can actually get that directly. So you do this, and you type auto module, and then you type iter together. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna import iter together, and it's gonna take the doc string out of this and it's gonna put it there. Pretty good. Let's try to build the docs again and, um, Okay, get an error. We get errors all the time. Is everybody upset about this error or do you think you know what it means? I can barely see it because I've got so many pop-up windows on top of everything right now. Um, okay, so anyway, the, prob the problem here is that uh, we're now trying to import these uh, extensions to the extensions to Sphinx all the way at the top and it doesn't know how to find it because we haven't pip installed it. So now we have to, you know, pip install Sphinx auto doc type hints. And, you know, if we just did that, we'd also get an error. So we're going to have to do Sphinx RTD theme. We're going to have to do Sphinx click EXT. Oh, okay. That last one wasn't right. It's just Sphinx click. I hope you're all thinking uh, the same thing right now. You're thinking, Charlie just spent all this time teaching us on how to automatically deal with all this build stuff. Why doesn't Tox just do this for us? The answer is it's going to, but let's, let's just build it first and show that it works. Um, make HTML. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to install click. Okay. Um, so Let's go back here because click should automatically be installed anytime we install the library. Let's make sure that that's one of our requirements for the, for the library. Click is going to be our command line interface thing. So let's pip install dash e dot. Okay. That installs all the stuff that's in the install required. Okay. Then we go back into our docs. Oop. CD editor together. Oh. oh, shoot. Huh. Okay. Should be good now. All right. Now we're going to open our index. And now I have to switch back to our, my other window. Okay. Good. Can everyone see this? Now, now we've got our, our new theme, which maybe you're familiar with this one because all the read the docs documentation looks like this. And we've got our code being imported right there and, and showing it. What is this autocomplete you're using? Um, I'm using the fish shell. It's, it's not the, the born again shell, it's not bash and it's not ZSH. Fish hot does this auto completion for you. Um, okay, so, so yeah, this is, this is nice. We just imported some documentation, but what you really wanna see is these nice automatic function documentations. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna go back to PyCharm and we're gonna be done with this in two minutes because it's so easy once you know it. So all we have to do is create a new file. We're gonna call this file utils.rst. You can call these files whatever you want inside your source directory. Um, I, would, I would avoid funny looking characters. Uh, they don't have to match up to the same thing as your Python files, but that might be a good scheme for organizing your documentation. Every, docu uh, every file needs a nice header. So, you know, utilities. And then we can start importing stuff. So we can do auto function iter together dot iter together. Okay. And then we have this utils file. We need to make sure that Sphinx knows about it. So we go into the index and we add it to the index utils. So you have the same name here as you have on your RST file, just without the dot RST. Sound good? Let's try and make it again. Hopefully everything goes good. We're gonna open it. 
I'm going to switch windows again so you can see my, my Firefox. Okay, and you can see now we've got a table of contents and it has utilities. And on the left side, we also have utilities. So if we click on that, boom, here is our function documented for us with all the stuff we put in it already. And it even did a good job to pull the strings out of the definition with the type annotations and stick them down here. The cool thing is um, it, it automatically links. So if I click stir right here, it's gonna move me to the Python documentation for that. Yeah, for strings, everybody knows strings, but if you're starting to use data types from your library, or perhaps you're using something like Torch, a PyTorch, and you wanna link to Torch's modules, this is really, really powerful. And it can allow people who are reading your documentation to very quickly start to understand what's going on. And without it, you know, they'd kind of be out of luck. They'd have to go and find where the documentation is and figure out where in the documentation that stuff is. All right, so I'm gonna leave the Sphinx stuff at that. You know, you can, you can start adding more files, more RST files. You can start nesting your structure when you start having bigger projects. You can, you can do all sorts of interesting things with these auto module and auto funk um, directives as they're called in, in restructured text, these things with the dot dots. Um, there's a question about Jupyter Notebook. There is a Jupyter Notebook extension for Click that will suck up the contents of a Jupyter Notebook. Sorry, not for Click, for Sphinx. It sucks up the contents of a Jupyter Notebook and will build it as HTML with your documentation. I don't know if I suggest doing that. I kind of went down that road one time and I started ending up with, um, with the scenario where I was writing a lot of code that wasn't really illustrative of how the library worked. So if you need to explain what your library does with the Jupyter Notebook, consider that you should be writing better documentation and that the stuff that you're doing in the Jupyter Notebook actually is applications of your code and not necessarily a documentation of the code itself. Now, if you wanna know the best way to structure your documentation, there's a really, really good talk from the, the guy who's in charge of uh, the Django documentation. And um, I forget what his name is, and I forget what the name of the talk was. I'll have to link it to you guys after, but uh, he's, he's got a really nice talk saying how you should think about documenting how the code works itself and then showing examples and how you should split that up and organize it. Okay, so that's it for actually doing the, the configuration for, for Sphinx and for all those extensions. Yeah, don't worry. I, I'm going to send that list of all the Python talks and it's in there. And then there was another question. Are version conflicts automatically resolved when setup.config is run or will some of it have to be written in manually? Um, yeah, PIP, PIP doesn't have a really good built-in dependency resolver. And this is an ongoing problem for the whole Python community, like theoretically. In practice, it's not usually a problem. And it's almost never been a problem for me. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. OK. Um, yeah, we're really running short on time. Uh, Dan, can you can you tell me really quick? Did you need to like be gone before the end of the talk, and will the talk keep going if you leave? Stan's still here. Yeah, yo, um, I can we, stay. I, I definitely have to leave by no, by yeah noon Pacific, but I can go up to noon. Will, will the talk end when you leave? Um, it will. Hmm. I could, I don't know how the recording will stop. Like if I, I can leave this open and then I guess when everybody leaves then. Uh. Yeah, you know what? No, I, I wanna finish by then because I think it's unfair if I take more than three hours of all of your time. Um, though, though, you know, it's, it's really great that you're all interested to listen. Uh, I could stop recording at the hour and then just leave the session open if people just wanna hang around and chat at the end. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy with that too. Maybe, maybe we, so, so yeah, we have 20 minutes left or maybe a little less than 20 minutes. So Dan isn't uh, like rushing at the end of, of uh, when he has to leave. So, so I want to show you guys last, I think we're not going to get to the click thing. I want to show you last how to set this all up with read the docs and how to make sure that you've got, um, you know, talks running some tests for this. And the nice thing is, let me, let me just double check. Am I sharing, uh, I'm sharing PyCharm now. Um, the nice thing is we can just copy paste the configuration for, for running the tests in talks. And this is good because, yeah, I don't want to have to explain it either. It's a little bit of a pain in the butt. All right, so we're going to come back to our talks configuration. 
And we're going to add another one to the bottom that I've copy pasted out of you know something else. Oh, I copy pasted it from PyBell, so it's not even you know appropriate. So so we've we've got to do a little bit of stuff. Turns out that there's this um, this setting in in the Tox configuration is called changeDir, which you know tells it to change directories before it starts running. And now there's this other thing called extras. Now remember we just had that problem where I totally forgot to install all those dependencies we needed because they weren't really dependencies for a library, but they were dependencies we might need when working with the libraries. And the cool thing is, uh, rather than just hand waving at everybody and saying, yeah, um, you know, sometimes you need to install this if you want to do this. No, no, no. We can put all of it in our setup.cfg. We've got extra settings for that. Turns out that there's another header that you can put in your setup.cfg called options dot extras require. And you can specify all sorts of different lists um, of, of extra requirements that you might want to use for different things. So when we're working with the docs, you know, you want to install Sphinx and you want to install Sphinx RTD theme. You also want to install Sphinx uh, Autodoc type hints. And you also want to install Sphinx Click. Now, these are all the things supporting hand wavy stuff. You know, the, the, this is the theme, the auto doc type hints takes all of the stuff from your type annotations and puts it into the documentation. And the quick thing maybe is, is not that important because we're not going to get to that. But anyway, now when you pip install, you can tell it, I want to also install the extra stuff for the docs. You know, what? sometimes we want to run tests. So maybe we also want to add a uh, set of extras for testing. We want to make sure that that PyTest gets installed if we're doing testing. So, so how that looks, now, now I'm going to jump down to the, um, to the command line, is when you're, when you're doing pip install, you, you can do pip install dashi, and after the dot, you can open up the square bracket, and you can type docs. And it turns out that if you type docs here, it's going to install all of these things that are in your extras requirements. You can even list a couple of them at the same time. You can say docs and testing, and it's going to install all the stuff from both docs and testing. So this is good. This means that we can we can more quickly tell people how to install the code that needs to, to come with all this stuff. All right, how does that help us? Because inside our talks configuration, we can tell it which ones of those extras to install. So when we have extras, we can say docs. I want it to install docs here. So it's going to do this when it does pip install. And then I'm not going to even bother explaining any of this stuff. I, I borrowed this from Scott Colby. Yeah, I didn't learn all this stuff on my own. I also have, have friends who have taught me some of this stuff. And uh, yeah, we've all figured these things out together. This I've never bothered to touch because it's so complicated looking. But um, it turns out that this is the kind of stuff that's actually being done by the make file. But now we're having talks run it for us. So if we, if we run our talks build and we do talks-e and we type docs, it's going to check that we can build all of these documentation properly. And, and to do that, it's going to have to install um, ooh, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to have to install uh, all of our Sphinx stuff, and it's going to have to install, oh boy. All right, I forgot one thing. Um, because, because we're using some of these system commands, which make dir and copy and cat, we need to give a whitelist, because Tox doesn't want to allow you to use any of the file system stuff that could be dangerous. So we're going to have to live on the edge a little bit ourselves, and we're going to copy paste some of this configuration that has what's called whitelists for externals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll back up to the top, and inside our default test stand is actually where we put this list. I'm not sure if this is technically correct, but it works, and I've never had a reason to change it. So let's just say it does. So the cat function, this is the concatenate function in, um, in Unix. CP is copy, mkdir is make dir, and uh, this, this user bind git thing we don't need right now, and we're not going to get to that, so I'm going to delete it. Okay, so I'm going to try running this one again, and I think it should work this time. Okay. Could not import extension, no module quick. You delete those weird requirements. Okay, so, sometimes it gets a little caught up and you have to reload it. So if you if you realize that it's it's using a cache that you need to have it redo it, you do dash R and that's like hard reload. Hopefully this works.
Huh. Hmm. I don't know what's going on. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna delete the problem rather than trying to fix it. We've all been there. Since we're not gonna get to this quick stuff, I think it's okay if we don't have the quick configuration installing properly. So yeah, yeah, I don't know why it wasn't installing quick because I've listed that in the setup.config. Anyway, um, not, not worrying about that little issue, which isn't really core to the fact that the Tox is now running this, this build. Is, the, the job right now is that it's checking that it can do the build and get to the end without having any errors. Because it will throw some errors if there's problems with the way that you've written your restructured text or you made some typos in some of these directives. And this will help you catch those. This is really good because now we can do git commit, um, you know, add sphinx config. And we can get push. And if any of you were, were trying to follow, um, you can you can follow along rather than me switching windows again. Is you can see that a new build will be triggered, and this time it's going to have even more stuff going on. Oh wait, no, it's not. I forgot something. Okay. Um, what do we what do we have to do every time we add a configuration? Is is we we create the environment, but we also need to go up to the top and add it into this env list. So unfortunately, add forgotten, forgotten item, new commit. Oh, even worse, I, I forgot to, uh, I forgot to get add all because normally I'm doing this from the UI and it just does it for you. <laughs> okay, add forgotten stuff. Okay, now we're gonna get push, great. There will be a recording of me, you know, showing that I have no idea how to use Git on the internet forever. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. I heard that Git was created by Linus Torvald just to slow everybody down. Rumors. Okay, so, so if you go and check, we, we should be able to see that we're building. So now we've gotten to the point where we've written documentation that tells people how to use our code, which they can now get and install however they feel like using our documentation in the README. And now all we have to do is tell read the docs, please build this every time so I don't ever have to think about it again. And, and this is really, really the case that once you've set up your code to build the documentation, you don't have to think about this again. So let's go to Safari again. And now you should be able to see my Safari window and you can see that we're, we're building. And I'm just gonna go to my next tab, which isn't Travis, but it's read the docs. So to, uh, to deal with read the docs, we're just gonna sign up and it's going to ask us, do you wanna sign up with GitHub? And the answer is yes, I don't wanna make more accounts. Do this for me. And then it's gonna ask, are you okay with authorizing this? And you're gonna say, yeah, sure. And then, oh man, well, yep, okay, I'm gonna sign up. All right, so, now we're on the read the docs uh, window and all we have to do is go to import a project. We only have to do this once for each project and then you kind of walk away and never think about it again. Um, oh, you have to verify your email address. Hold on, I guess I'm gonna have to go to the other window to do that. Uh, read the docs. Link. Confirm. Okay, good. Now we're ready to import our project and we're going to refresh. Good. Okay, now uh, after we refreshed, it's listing our, our project and we're going to click plus button. And this is the place where you give it a name and you can never take this one back. So be very careful when you pick your name. So I'm going to pick a name that's kind of goofy because I don't want to take a nice name somebody might want in the future. So we're going to call this CT Hoyt um, teaching, you know, 2020-06-03. No one's ever going to want that name, so it's not going to make anyone upset. Okay, and then I click next. And this is cool, webhook successfully added. So what this did, you know, I just, I, I jumped through those pages very quickly where I, 
added um, read the docs to GitHub, but I gave GitHub the same permission, I gave read the docs the same permissions on my GitHub account that Travis wanted. It checks every time we push and it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna clone the repository and it's gonna say, hey look, there's a folder called docs and hey look, there's a conf.py file inside there for Sphinx. Let's build the docs for you. And then it does that every time you make a push and you never have to think about it again, except for this one thing that we forgot. It's gonna fail because we didn't tell it that it needs to install some of the extras. Remember we added this Sphinx RTD theme and we added these other Sphinx things. Turns out that keeps coming back and nipping us in the butt. So it already tried building it and it already failed. So we can look at these builds and figure out, uh-oh, could not import extension. So what do we do? We don't fret, we just make more metadata and more configuration. So we're gonna go back to PyCharm and we're going to make probably, this is gonna be the last thing that we do. And once we see success, we're gonna declare victory. We're gonna make a new file called read the docs.yaml. And inside read the docs.yaml, we're going to put something very, very simple. Sorry, it has to be dot read the docs. YAML. And we don't need those. So um, I think if you read this, you probably, I hope you can see this. Yeah. Okay. You, you probably understand exactly what's going on here. We tell it we want Python 3. We want it to use pip to install it. And we want it to install these extras that are specified in docs. Remember, we had this docs uh, extras in setup.cfg. Once we have that, we should be good. So let's git add all git add dot read the docs dot yaml hit commit add okay here we go now we're gonna go back to safari we're gonna look at our new builds okay and we're gonna watch our builds because that's what we're gonna do with our time. See what's going on here, okay. Anyone have any questions right now while we're, while we're sitting around waiting for a minute? It's looking good. Okay. Um, uh, my reaction to Python 3.5. Um, Python 3.5 is getting a little older. Uh, there's a couple things that were introduced after Python 3.5 that I really enjoy, like F strings, and uh, a lot of the newer typing annotations have been added since then. Um, unfortunately, there's a uh, a downstream project that until very recently was also supporting Python 3.5. And, and because I didn't want to break compatibility for them, I also was continuing to support Python 3.5 and PyBell. But um, you know, now now it's it's kind of been like six years or something since Python 3.6 came out, right? I, I don't know. I, don't quote me on that. But uh, yeah, people are starting to move to the more recent Pythons. I mean, if, if you were paying attention, Python 2 like just had its end of life at the beginning of this year. And it was like over 10 years um, since, since the last uh, major build for that, right? I mean, yeah, it's been Python 3 for a long time. All right. Um, in the meantime, our build is completed. And, and to answer this question, uh, uh, what was the point of Read the Docs? The point is to have a website do everything for us and to host our documentation. So, so now our project that we just built together over the last three hours is is now documented on Read the Docs. And every time we make changes to it, they will get reflected here. And so people will be able to understand what's going on. All right. Um, I think that's that's kind of it. I think I have to bring it to a close there. There's a couple things that I didn't get to, right? And, and a couple people are asking now uh, because I'm not gonna talk about quick. I'd be happy to, to stay around and, and discuss some more stuff with people if they, they want to, but let's like call it, um, Let's call it done. So, so one of the questions was, 
how to find uh, our VT teams for the doc. So uh, who, who took, who, who was in charge of that? I think there's a link to the, the read the docs for the VT, the task VT repository. I think I put the link in the, the repository. Let's, let's look at that really quick. I think we've got documentation and we've got a link docs passing. So yeah, here we go. We're on read the docs right now and we're looking at the, the task VT documentation. Um, yeah, so so by the way, once you're once when you're kind of perusing around the read the docs configuration, you can you can go back into your projects and you can look at them. And one of the things that was at the bottom of the list that's really, really fun is this badges thing. You see, you can get the badge that links to this. You can copy paste the stuff out of the, the badge link and put it into your own readme file. Okay, which you can't see me doing right now. But anyway, you can add the, the badge that goes for read the docs. You can add the badge that goes to your Travis builds. Um, you can add the, the badges for a couple of the other things that we didn't really get to and some, some other stuff like uh, code coverage. So yeah, what did we not get to? Uh, let, me, let me kind of go through the things that we didn't quite have time for. One of the things I wanted to talk about, there were a couple more um, configurations to add to talks that, that you know, you can, you can figure those ones out on your own. One of them is, uh, is just checking for the, the syntax within all of your restructured text. Like in addition to the Sphinx build, there's also some stuff to check to make sure that your um, setup dot, sorry, so that your readme file and some of your other files that are RST are in the correct format. Um, we didn't, we didn't talk about implementing command line interfaces using click. And, and this is really, really, really important, I think, for usability for other people is to make command line interfaces. Because not everyone actually wants to, to make Python scripts and pull up the Python REPL. So we actually benefited a lot from this throughout this entire three hours together, right? We saw PyRoma, we saw PyTest, Tox itself. All of these are command line interfaces to, to the code. Um, and you know how, how to write those yourself it's a little a, a little tricky I, i'd actually say it's not so bad because if you if you look at the examples you'll, you'll see that um we can basically turn any any code into a command line interface um we just have to use this if uh if name equals main thing and uh and then there's another special kind of file you can put inside uh, a directory inside your python package called dunder main and then it knows to run that as a command line interface. So you can take advantage of that. And then you can do one more thing inside the, the setup.cfg to, to link your, your command line interface to having a nice vanity function. So if you want to have it or together from the command line interface, that's possible. Um, we didn't get to talk about the manifest, which is another thing that's really important before you start uh, pushing to PyPI. Oh, and, and since uh, why, why do I need click when I have arg parse? Yeah, this is something I could also spend three hours um, ranting about. Arg parse's interface makes incredibly confusing code. Click's interface makes incredibly beautiful code that makes it easy to wrap the code that you've already written, forces good habits. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to show you all those good habits. So uh, we'll have to wait until next time. Or if somebody's got some specific examples, I can help them with a pull request maybe. Um, Okay, we didn't get to talk about pushing to PyPI, which is really important. There's only a couple steps. Once you've, once you've done all this stuff and it's packaged up, and you're like just a couple lines away from uploading to, to PyPI. You just have to um, install the program that uploads it to PyPI. And then you do, you know, uh, Python setup.py. And then you, yeah, you do this QDist. Yeah, I, anyway, it's, it's in the documentation for, for the finished repository. You can check that one out. So. Um, I would suggest using test PyPI for the first couple of times you do this just till you get the hang of it so you don't accidentally put something on PyPI and then take a name that you don't want because uh, a name is forever on, on PyPI. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then there's this whole bump version thing, which, yeah, so we talked about how there's a version string in this place and that place and the other place, and bump version is a program that just takes care of making sure those all go together. And, uh, you know, there's this dash dev thing at the end. You should always take the dash dev away just before you uh, make a release to IPI because you don't want to tell people that the code that they're using is dev code. Well, maybe you do, but you probably don't. You probably don't want to make a release when it's not dev. Okay, I have two minutes left. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I want to make a, a very short plug before I go. 
And um, so, so let me let me copy and paste some stuff. Um, you know, the last couple of days have been really difficult in the United States for a lot of people, and th there's a lot of ways that people have been reaching out on the internet to to help. There's been all sorts of bad things happening. So I just wanted to share something with you guys. There's a couple of places that might be helpful uh, for you to donate to if you want to help some of the people who've been protesting in, in Black Lives Matter. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, th this talk, I hope it was helpful for you. If, if it was, maybe you could, you could return the favor by, by donating to one of these funds, even if it's just a dollar. Uh, you don't have to donate anything, but maybe uh, this is a good way to pay me back for three hours of my time. I don't know. I, I like to think that uh, we, could, we could do our best to help in, in the ways that we can. So again, thanks for listening. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hang around and answer questions. Um, my contact information, uh, first it's cthoyt at gmail.com. There's also Twitter, I'm cthoyt there. My website is also cthoyt.com. Tapley is my, my grandmother's maiden name and Hoyt is a Welsh name from, from 1405 or something or other when they went from, from Wales over to Canada. And then in the end of the 1800s, they went down from from Canada to Massachusetts, and I grew up in Connecticut, so that's my life story. <laughs> yeah, all right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Charlie, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Corona Y also for helping to promote the event. Um, thank you for pointing out the different places we can donate and help out. I mean, that's critically important right now, and I really appreciate you making that plug at the end. Um, so, so thank you all for joining. Uh, there was already tons of great feedback about the session, and I'm excited to post this and get people to start making good, reusable Python code. So uh, for follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Charlie, definitely. And if you can post any links that are like good complementary kind of um, resources after the talk, then that, that's yep, a great thing I'll, I'll keep making updates to that, that Google page, um, that, and then I'll, I'll post them all here, and I'll send them to you again, because you should upload this video to the Corona Y YouTube channel, but I, it'd be best if you made it public and, and searchable because some, excuse me, some of the videos aren't searchable, but this one would be probably helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Good. All right, I'll end the recording now. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was amazing. Bye-bye. Okay.